Well, hi there, and welcome to Actual Tech Media's Megacast. I hope you guys are all having a nice little morning dance party with me at our countdown video there. I am pumped up and ready to get into today's topic, understanding your cloud-native data protection and disaster recovery options. Now, I want to start out by pausing to say a giant thank you to all of you for joining us uh, and being a part of this exciting conversation around cloud-native security because a lot of your organizations are probably increasing your reliance on cloud-native applications, and that is awesome. But it also comes with some unique challenges and some requirements when it comes to data protection and backup in particular. So on the Megacast today, we have some of the most innovative experts from leading companies in maintaining, protecting, and recovering data in your cloud native applications, in your cloud environments there. So you are going to be hearing from experts at Spanning, Rubrik, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Veeam, Haiku, and Metallic, a Commvault Venture. Today, we will explore the hottest solutions, trends, and creative strategies all here in one place, one megacast. This is going to be an absolutely incredible conversation. I hope that you're ready to dive in. Let's get started. So to kick off our day here today, I want to go over a few housekeeping things that are just going to help you get the most out of our conversation. First and foremost, take a look at your audience console in front of you right now, and I want you to find that questions window on the console there. Now, if you haven't already said hi, there is a big and just absolutely awesome crew of people here with us today. So reach out, give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Tell us how you're doing today, where you're coming in from, whatever else you feel like letting us know today, what you had for breakfast, you know, whatever you're in the mood to share, let us know. Uh, but also with this questions window, what's important to remember about this is we want this to be an informative webinar for you. We want this to be an interactive conversation. So that means we want to see those technical questions. So throughout the megacast, we hope you will get engaged, ask those questions, post any links, post any thoughts, you know, let us know what you're kind of dealing with and how uh, cloud native security solutions and strategies uh, have been a part of your journey, your organization, or, or for you as an individual. Now, not only are we going to have team members responding to you during the live webinar, we also will have dedicated Q&A sessions at the end of our presentations. And if we don't have time, as you guys know, if you've been to these megacasts before, you know they go by quickly. If we don't get to stop and spend a lot of time uh, getting to all the questions in between sessions, don't worry, because the awesome humans from Spanning, Rubrik, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Veeam, Haiku, and Metallica a Commvault Venture, are going to be following up with you afterwards. So not only over live chat, we also make sure that they get all the questions after we wrap so that they can follow up with anyone who needs a little bit more of a longer uh, answer or explanation. Now the next thing I want to point out on your audience console here, there are going to be lots of really fun little aha moments throughout the day today. If you want to share that with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use that Twitter button right there on the, on the console in front of you. And the hashtag for today's megacast is going to be automatically added to your post. And the last thing I want to point out before we move on from our lovely guided tour here today uh, is actually that handout tab. So it's right next to the questions tab where we started out. You're going to find some fantastic resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. I'm going to keep Keep reminding you about this area because it is absolutely jam packed with information. We have solution briefs, white papers, ebooks, data sheets, free trials, upcoming webinars, and more. So click around in that handout section and be sure to download some of those awesome resources to save for later. Now, for those of you that I haven't met yet, my name is Jess Steinbuck. I'm with Actual Tech Media. I am so happy to be one of your moderators for this megacast today. Now, Scott Becker is here on live chat, and David Davis is going to join us in just a moment for a very interesting keynote discussion. So you get the whole awesome moderator crew today. All right, speaking of awesome, we also have some great prizes for you. So take a look on the screen for you here. You can see on the Megacast you could win one of five Apple iPhone 14 Pros. Plus, 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 we are, will be giving away a $500 Amazon gift card every 30 minutes. Now, as a reminder, and I'm going to say this a lot today, so you're going to hear this a lot, you do need to be here live in attendance at the Megacast in order to win. And all winners must meet the actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. And if you're not sure what those prize terms and conditions are, you can head on back over to that handout tab that we were just talking about. See how great that tour was? Now you're ready. Head on back over to that handout tab, scroll down to the bottom, and you will find the full T's and C's waiting for you right there. All right, now another great way to win a prize today and, and best of all, intrinsically, you will benefit from increasing the value of our conversation that we're having today is to ask a wonderful question. So 
throughout the session today, we will be collecting all the questions asked in each one of our presentations. And then after we wrap, we will take a look at all the questions and we will decide which one is the best. Uh, and then we will send them a $50 Amazon gift card. So the important thing to remember here is that this is an opportunity to win an additional $50 prize in each one of our sessions. And we follow up with you afterwards, regardless of whether or not your question is read out live during our Q&A section. So keep that in mind. Uh, and also, hey, again, a reminder, the more questions you ask, the better the conversation is. So just keep that coming in general. But, you know, prizes never hurt either. So there's a chance to win one of those. Speaking of prizes, a few little reminders and requirements up on the screen for you here, including the fact that all grand prize winners are required to submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. Now, if you are a lucky winner here today and you are interested in this option, you always have uh, the choice to donate the value of your prize to one of the selected charities you see up on the screen. Now, thanks to generous prize winners on previous Actual Tech Media webinars, thousands of dollars have been donated to these wonderful organizations. So if you are a lucky winner and you want to get involved in that particular way, uh, please do let us know because we would love to help make that happen. Now, we're pretty happy that you are here with us live at the Megacast today. Uh, and we want to keep that good feeling going. We want to keep chatting. We want to hear from you and, and uh, know what's up in your life and your world. So please do reach out and connect to Actual Tech Media on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm also going to highly recommend that you spend some time uh, on the Actual Tech Media YouTube channel. Make sure that you're subscribed because there's just a ton of content. Any topic that you're looking to explore, there is something there for you. So make sure you've got all of that bookmark in your favorites tab there. All right, one last thing before we jump into our sessions. I do want to make sure you all remember about another great way to win a prize and and double benefit, increase our awesome community here. So uh, you can refer a friend, an industry friend or coworker. You're going to find a link to do that right in your handouts tab, back to that handy dandy handouts tab. You're also going to get automatically redirected at the end of the webinar. Now I do want to promise you because I know that it's always a concern when you're signing a friend up for something. We will not spam a friend or a coworker of yours. What we're going to do is send them an invite to a list of upcoming webinars. And if they don't respond to us, we just give them one little reminder or they're busy. We just want to make sure they heard, uh, they saw that message from us. And then that's it. That's it. We'll stop there. Then both you and your coworker can win a $300 Amazon gift card. We hold those drawings every month. So be sure to get those referrals in. It could be a win-win situation for you both. Well, speaking of win-win, <laughs> We've got uh, a lot of great information covered already, and we are only getting better from here because up next, I get to introduce you all to one of my all-time favorite experts and fellow moderator here at Actual Tech Media, and that is, of course, the one and only David Davis. Hey, David, thank you so much for joining us on the Megacast today. Now, I know you have some really fun stuff to cover with us, so I am going to hand the mic right on over to you. Take it away, David. Thanks so much, Jess. Many of us are excited about the possibilities, the possibilities that cloud native applications can provide our company. I mean, after all, cloud native apps, they offer potentially more scalability, more agility, more availability. I mean, that's what Gmail's run on. That's what Netflix has run on. At the same time, if implemented incorrectly or without proper understanding, or the variety of ecosystem tools and features, that we're used to having with traditional applications where we run our virtual machines, cloud native applications could be a huge failure. And it's important to understand why protecting cloud native apps is different than protecting traditional applications. So I wanna start off here with this blog post. It's a great post from Haney Michael over at VMware.com. And it's entitled Kubernetes Introduction for VMware Users, Part 1, The Theory. It is a great series of posts. And I come from a virtualization background, uh, specifically a VMware background in IT. And I suspect that many of you do out there as well. Now, in the post, Haney compares all the traditional components of a VMware infrastructure with the components that would make up a cloud-native Kubernetes infrastructure. And being a visual person, what I love about the post is that there's so many graphics that compare the different pieces of a VMware infrastructure with a Kubernetes infrastructure. And one of my favorites is this one right here, which looks really busy, really crazy, and it is, but it's also super useful. So on the left, you've got a vSphere infrastructure. On the right, you've got a Kubernetes infrastructure. As you can see, the ESXi hosts on the left become 
Kubernetes nodes on the right. And those nodes could be physical servers, they could be virtual machines, they could be running in the public cloud, and all the different management units that make up these two different infrastructures are kind of right there in the middle. You know, starting at the bottom, you've got the storage, data stores versus volumes. You've got compute resources. You've got your virtual clusters, which are your resource pools versus your namespaces. You've got your unit of scaling or your atomic unit, which is the VM versus the pod. You've got the vSphere HA DRS cluster compared to the Kubernetes node cluster. But the most important difference here is at the very top, and that is how vCenter server used for management of the vSphere infrastructure is replaced in a Kubernetes infrastructure with the Kubernetes master, which could be a physical server, could be a virtual machine, and likely you're going to have multiple master servers in your control plane, all load balanced. And so even this diagram is really an oversimplification. So with vSphere, it's the vCenter server that holds the state of the virtual infrastructure. And with Kubernetes, it's the Kubernetes master nodes, specifically the etcd database that holds the state of the Kubernetes infrastructure. But in one instance, the state of the infrastructure, in my opinion, is much more important, much more valuable. So let's now talk about a concept I'm sure most of you have heard of before, the pets versus cattle analogy. I love the graphic here with the little kitty with its sad eyes versus the cows. And so, of course, the traditional virtual infrastructure or physical servers, those are treated like pets. I remember having naming contests in the IT department where we come up with naming schemes, you know, maybe the transformers or maybe Greek gods that will be used across all of our production servers. And we treated them like our pets versus in the cloud native architecture, pods and containers, they're treated like cattle. They're spun up, they're destroyed by the hundreds or thousands. So why is this important when it comes to cloud native data protection? Well, it's because in a virtualized environment, these virtual machines, those are treated as our pets. We love them, we name them, we take good care of them, we monitor them. They're relatively static. They may be monolithic applications or they may be you know, multi-tiered applications. You might have a database tier with, let's say, three virtual machines running as your database servers in a highly available cluster. You might have some application servers running in a cluster. You might have some web servers in a cluster, but they're all relatively static. They're not being spun up and spun down by the hundreds or thousands. And when it comes to data protection, your job in a virtualized environment is to protect that pet at all costs, protect those virtual machines. Every one of them is unique for the most part and important. But when you redesign your applications and you implement them in a cloud native design, those applications are treated more like the cattle. They're changing, they're dynamic, they're constantly spun up, destroyed, recreated, again, by the hundreds or thousands, just to meet the needs of the end users and the needs of the availability for the organization. This is a design concept for cloud native applications. They're designed in this microservices architecture where you might have hundreds of web servers, hundreds of database servers, hundreds of application middleware servers. And for that reason, you need to be able to recreate the cattle. And I hope you're catching the difference here. With virtualized apps, you gotta protect the virtual machines and recover those specific virtual machines. With cloud native apps, you have to be able to recreate the environment. Basically what you need to recover your cloud native environment is contained in the master node, the etcd database, and then the associated container images. And for that reason, you need data protection and disaster recovery tools that are designed to understand the cloud native environment, to know about the Kubernetes master, the etcd database, how to protect it, how to recover it, and how to allow you to recreate the cattle versus the virtualized environment where the data protection tool is focused on protecting the individual virtual machines. And then another important tenet of cloud native architectures is that they're designed to be portable. These applications running in the pods distributed across hundreds or thousands of different microservices are designed to run 
really wherever you want them to run. They could run on-premises. They could run in Azure. They could run in AWS, Google Cloud, IBM. No matter where they're running or no matter where they're distributed, you need to be able to protect the applications and be able to recreate them should disaster strike. So here's a graphic of what a cloud-native application might look like. Again, distributed across many different microservices. You've got API services, application data, stateless services, stateful services, persistent data in shared Docker volumes, analytics tools, monitoring and diagnostics tools, and this is just a single application. And inside every one of these different services, there are multiple pods that provide scalability and availability. So you can see how very quickly a cloud native application can get complex, but because typically these pods are stateless, what you need to be able to do is to have the application images ready along with the state of the Kubernetes architecture so that these pods can be spun up by the scheduler in a Kubernetes deployment or replica set to get this application back up and running. In summary, when selecting data protection and disaster recovery tools for cloud native environments, understand that cloud native applications are different than traditional apps by design and that they require unique data protection and disaster recovery tools. And that's what you're going to see on today's event. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Jess. Well, thanks, David, and thank you for that awesome keynote. Always fun. I also enjoyed the Puss in Boots <laughs> image on that, uh, and, uh, and a great way to kick off our megacast here today. Uh, speaking of getting rolling, we have a quick question for you here. And again, this is going to help us kind of get an idea of where, where everyone's at. Now, I'm going to show you a results page in just a second. So you are all going to get to see where everyone in the audience is coming today and, and where they're kind of at in their, in their cloud native journey. Um, so the question is, where are you on your cloud native journey? Uh, so we're using cloud native uh, and we need to protect them. We're testing, maybe kind of dipping a toe in the water getting started. So there's a couple different options here. Uh, and, and let us know um, uh, where your organization is at. And I'm just seeing a comment here from Dan saying that he really liked uh, David's analogy as well and, and simplify everything. Totally agree. Yes, Dan. <laughs> I think we're, uh, we're always striving to do that here. Okay, so uh, do go ahead and click on that poll. I'm just giving everyone another second because I'm still seeing some answers trickling in. And then I'm going to flip over to the results page because I want to give you an idea where you are all at today. All right, let's head to the results now together. Okay, so you can see there that we are uh, just about half kind of getting started in the learning phase about cloud native. So that's really interesting. A lot of people still in that learning phase, which means that the conversation today is going to be a lot of fun because we're all kind of learning together. Uh, and then kind of a, a little bit the next one is we're using and then the next one is uh, the, the least is testing. Um, so speaking of which, when we're talking about time frames, so you, wherever you're at in your journey, today you're going to learn something new. You're going to either be learning about fortifying or enhancing existing systems, or maybe you're learning about adding in whole new things. So when you think about those solutions and strategies and improvements and enhancements and adjustments and all the things that you have on your radar, are you thinking short term, you need these changes urgently, they have to happen within a month or two, or are you thinking maybe closer to six months to a year? Uh, let us know what the time frame is. Let us know what your urgency or lack thereof is. All right, well, I'm going to move things along in just a moment here because as fun as it is to just sit here and do polls all day, and, and I do enjoy that, <laughs> we need to get into our sessions because we have an incredible expert speaker waiting in the wings, and I cannot wait to introduce you all to him. So our very first expert presenter on today's Megacast is Sham Oza, Director of Product Management at Spanning. Sham, thank you so much for being here to kick us off and get us started. Uh, the platform is all yours. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. Great setup, and it's 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 great to meet people you know who are new to this because when you're new to this, um, that means you've taken that first step in taking this uh, challenge in your organization seriously. And it is a huge challenge that many organizations have faced. And in the product world, one of the benefits that I've had is learning from customers about what's going on, how they're dealing with challenges, and being able to share that insight with you 
not just funnel it back into product engineering and innovation, which is happening all the time. And you know, one of the first things you want to keep in mind is when you're looking for solutions vendors out there, you want to look for folks who are battle tested. One of the things that we're very proud of is we've been around since 2010. We've been doing cloud backup. Uh, you know, we've built these solutions from the ground up. We have 24 by seven support. We're tested in the field. So we have, you know, over 17,000 customers, unique customers with almost 2.2 million seats being protected across them. And in 2022, we actually helped customers test and restore to production over a billion items. And this is something that's really important is making sure you're not just learning about the technology and the landscape, but making sure that you're working with vendors who know their stuff, because you're going to see this a lot. Um, and this is not something that I want to dwell on too much. You know, if you want to understand the technology of going from on-prem to SaaS, there's tons of content out there, but I want to emphasize one really important thing that happens when you move from that legacy on-prem model to SaaS, IaaS, and PaaS. And that's regardless of what vendor you're using, what layer of technology you're using, it's always going to fall on your uh, shoulders and your responsibility to make sure that human errors, you know, insider activity, ransomware and viruses, are not getting into your systems because that's not the vendor's responsibility. And the most common cause, and that's what I want to talk to you guys about uh, today, is you're going to hear a lot about technology. You're going to hear a lot about really cool tools and, and you know, uh, high availability and all this stuff coming from your cloud vendors. But a lot of times what they don't talk about are the challenges that you face once you're out in the wild and what can go wrong. And a lot of times I know folks here are going to say, you know, it's because of our users. They're, you know, remote and hybrid now. They're much harder to work with. They were already a pain to manage inside the firewall. Now they're outside the firewall. Their systems are harder to back up and secure, patch, and all that kind of stuff. And as we've seen with the rise of all of this amazing new technology, people are deploying um, into the cloud, but also deploying different types of clouds. Clouds for SaaS for collaboration, IaaS for running, you know, legacy workloads, and then even looking at Kubernetes and things like that for modern applications. All of these things have very different configurations, buttons, dials, behaviors, and that can become a nightmare to manage. Um, so you've got this, you know, kind of hybrid workload scenario and hybrid workers converging in one place. And I know it can be very easy to blame that worker but I really want you to think about it for a second. These guys could be working from home. The kids are home from school at the same time. They're juggling a bunch of things. They're getting ready for a meeting that's about to start in just a minute. And then they hear a loud bang. They hear the kids screaming. The dog did something. They get distracted. They're probably one of your star employees. And what they don't realize is they accidentally clicked on a malicious link because it was sent out right around the time they expected to go into a meeting. They weren't paying attention. It said steering committee. That's something that they're used to being a part of. And it was actually a phishing link. And now they've accidentally gone to the wrong site. They're going to be taken advantage of. It could be a cross-site scripting attack. It can get even worse. And one of the things I want to talk about in, in 2023 is all of this cool technology uh, is kind of scaring people. Um, it, it's making other people laugh. Um, but I think we need a bit of a reality check. Um, you know, AI is not perfect. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, results recently of AI where people were asking the AI to create the image of a, of a salmon swimming around in the water and the AI prompt took it the wrong way um, and started giving us these delicious salmon fillets uh, swimming around in a river. So AI is by no means perfect, um, but just like those, um, spam phishing emails, um, just like those spam phone calls and robocalls that you get, AI is going to be able to start to build content at scale that allows us, or, or not us, but allows the bad guys to bypass things like traditional spam filters, antivirus, and also catch people off guard um, because there's no longer a generic script. You can hit somebody with a custom script that responds to them and seems like a believable person. 
And you can kind of see that online. Um, you know, when you look at these folks and you go, well, you know, do you trust these people? Are these folks real? And you may be saying, well, I do my due diligence. I check out LinkedIn. I check out if they have a blog and all of this stuff. But if AI is able to generate believable faces, believable accounts, believable content, um, suddenly this can become a lot harder. And, you know, you may stuff out that somebody is scamming you, but it might be too late by a certain point. Maybe you've already given somebody the credentials. Maybe you've already given somebody the information or allowed them to access the system that they weren't supposed to. And also folks can get tricked in their personal lives, give up sensitive information, you know, maybe a password that's common with what's being used within the organization. And when I say these guys are getting fancy, um, a lot of these bad guys are really committing to the grift. So this fake bot here, Abby Feldman, um, when it was called out and, and kind of covered in a report, actually responded back to the people and said, you know, a fake response. I just got off the phone with my lawyer. I'm going to be suing you and all this stuff. So they really, really commit to the grift and the scam now. Um, and they're getting more and more creative. Ultimately, this account was suspended. Um, but you can just imagine if this is happening with millions of accounts um, out there, it can get pretty, pretty scary, pretty, pretty quick. And once those people have the trust of your users, they have access into a system, what they can do after that is very, very frightening. You know, you go back to a disgruntled employee back in 2014. This is kind of was the eye opening experience for me personally. So I'll never forget this one. Um, but basically an angry employee at uh, Code Spaces at the time, a darling child of, of um, you know, the startup world and the VC world had an angry employee who deleted the backups, deleted production and went away because he wasn't happy. Maybe he was getting fired. Maybe he wasn't happy with the pay he was getting. Um, and the organization and many of the customers that they supported went belly up overnight. Social engineering attacks, some from teenage kids um, in, in the UK, were able to hack into sophisticated uh, operations at Rockstar Games, uh, the guys who make Grand Theft Auto, um, as well as Uber, um, and actually got to the point where they got access to the encrypted keys um, for a lot of their sensitive cloud workloads. And, you know, other times people are just being jerks. Um, they can exfiltrate data. In, in the case in uh, Australia, a lot of these guys were actually trying to sow political discord, access the data, and just shared it out into the world. They weren't even interested in corrupting or, or deleting the data. And we don't really see this changing. Right. It's an almost seven billion dollar industry, uh, according to the FBI in, in 2021. We can see with the trend that it's obviously going up. And one of the scary things is with with this much opportunity, things start to get professional. It starts to become almost like organized crime. Um, people are building repositories online. They're building, you know, and selling ransomware as a service kits, bots you know, and, and communities that are constantly evolving these bots in, in a sort of war between the, the, the black hats and the white hats. Um, and so being bad, you know, is good for business. And these types of attacks um, aren't going to slow down. And we're seeing that in, in real tangible ways, right? So 77% of organizations uh, using a SaaS tool um, have experienced the data loss of some kind in the last year. And what really hit home for me was that in the event of a data loss, 43% were not able to fully recover when they had that incident. That is a startling number. It is around 90% recovery for on-prem workloads. So we've done a really good job of uh, securing our on-prem environment, securing our hybrid and private cloud environments. But when it comes to SaaS in particular, we seem to have a really, really big, you know, vulnerability. And my response to you, and this is something that you need to evaluate when you think of data protection uh, strategies, right? Losing the data and getting it uh, and, and trying to get it back is actually the last thing, you know, you want to do. That's the safety net at the very bottom. Um, you know, that's when everything else has gone wrong. In reality, the way you want to combat this is not just thinking about backup and recovery tools, 
but backup and recovery tools that integrate with other solutions that can prevent the data loss from ever occurring in the first place. Just some examples include things like phishing defense tools. A lot of folks out there don't realize it, but the origin of many of these attacks is somebody getting phished. The credentials get stolen, that compromised account is used to contact someone else and then perform a social engineering scam. And then finally, the ransomware actually gets into the customer's environment. Now, once those credentials are compromised, they can show up on the dark web, which is another frightening thing. And you want to invest in technology and solutions that are not just backing up your environment, but constantly monitoring it. So with our Unitrends module and family of products, we do things like detect ransomware in your environment. And we're not just looking at simple things like rates of change, but we're looking for randomness, things that are indicative of ransomware versus something like you know, BitLocker. And we also do the same thing when it comes to SaaS backup, looking at things like Salesforce for anomalies and massive rates of change that could indicate a runaway script or a bad actor. And in the end, eventually there is a data loss. And that's where a solution like Spanning Backup for Microsoft 365 or many of our solutions comes into play. And in this case, what actually happened to this customer was they had a ransomware attack on an endpoint. That endpoint was leveraging OneDrive. And when those files were encrypted, those changes were actually encrypted up to the cloud. And this customer basically had a brick laptop and encrypted files sitting in OneDrive for business. And so what happened was the customer just logged into spanning, was able to navigate the interface in about five minutes and begin the recovery and get back up and running before anybody knew what happened. Obviously, they had to provision a new laptop, but the core data was safe because of spanning backup. And we're talking about SaaS in this case. Some of you have existing solutions, but what's really important to understand is that we as an organization protect your data no matter, matter where it lives. And what's even more important is we're not just protecting all of these different workloads, but we're doing it all through a single consolidated UI, a single interface that you know, syncs with your PSA systems, things with your IT documentation systems and other tools because we don't want to waste time and you know technician time especially just troubleshooting and monitoring backups that should all be in a single place and the last piece of information you know that I'll leave you with is you guys are thinking about backup and in your native options if you're doing that also please start thinking about cyber insurance this is something you want in place Again, in case everything goes wrong, but also backup and these integrated solutions go hand in hand with cyber insurance. We talked to some customers who actually had cyber insurance and when they actually made their claim, they were told, hey, you didn't patch this critical vulnerability or you didn't do recovery testing or RPO and RTO testing. That was the fine print in this document you're not going to get the payment or you're getting half of the settlement or a quarter of the settlement, which is crazy when you think about it, the amount of effort people put in just to get covered. And that's something that as a vendor, as a partner, we provide. So we can not only give you tools and solutions that do a lot of this stuff, like giving you reports that tell you what your RPO and RT are going to be, that give you automated testing, that alert your system so you can respond quickly and integrate with RMM tools and other tools to patch. This is what you're looking for. And in the end, we know that backup is fragmented across many solutions. We know it wastes a lot of time and we know it can be expensive. But when you look at something like spanning backup or any of the Kaseya family of backup products, you consolidate everything into a single uh, provider. You have one person to call when you're in trouble. With our SaaS solutions, you're not wasting time doing configurations, setting up devices, you just add an app from the store. And when you bundle a lot of these solutions together, you can typically save up to about a third of the cost you would spend on disparate solutions. And I know I've been bragging a lot. I showed you a customer example uh, you know, before. Definitely reach out to us. We have a number of customers on-prem, hybrid, and in SaaS that are very, very happy with what we have. And we're trying to share a lot of this thought leadership you know, with you guys. So we have a ton of 
additional resources that you can access for free. We have eBooks on business continuity best practices, um, guides on how to evaluate Microsoft 365 if you're getting into it uh, for the first time. And then ultimately, we would love to talk to you. We'd love to understand what workloads you're protecting, give you a demo of the tools, really get nerdy and excited. Um, but in the end, you want to make sure that you're thinking about these things, making sure your posture isn't just thinking about backup tools and solutions, but what can go wrong you know, in your environment. So thank you so much for this time and opportunity. I hope we can chat more um, you know, in the future. Oh, thank you so much, Sean. That was such a great presentation. Uh, really interesting. I was, I was laughing at the salmon fillet swimming around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> AI is scary, but it's not perfect. It's not taking over the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were we were all kind of laughing internally the other day at at a transcription saying that that kept. Um, I think I said something about it was an exciting webinar, and it said uh, exciting women at actual tech media, and I was like, yeah, hey, that's. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> nothing, nothing false in that statement. Nope, no. And it kept translating uh, ransomware into ran somewhere. So that's, that led to a lot of memes in our oh, <laughs> internal no. chat. You got to love AI. Uh, and, and I think we have a few questions related to that, actually, that I want to come back to. But before we jump into that, I do actually want to just point out that you had a question for our audience here. Um, and, and you were kind of wondering, um, you know, for folks out there, they're thinking about SaaS backup. Are they thinking Google Workspace, uh, Microsoft 365, or Salesforce? Um, obviously, if it's none of the above or, or you have a different option, please feel free to write that into the chat, and Sean and I will be taking a look as well. Um, Sean, did you have anything you wanted to add to this poll? Yeah, I mean, uh, we know a lot of people also have multiple workloads. So one of the things I say is, you know, many times if you're looking at education, we see customers who have Microsoft 365 for the faculty and staff, um, and then Google for the, for the students. We see many uh, mid-market enterprise customers uh, who use something like Microsoft 365 or Google Workspace uh, for collab, and then pair it with Salesforce for customer management. Um, so just in the SaaS world, we already see people using, you know, two or more solutions. Um, so it's, it's definitely going to be common. Um, and start thinking about this as, as you, you know, the, the responsible party for your, for your uh, IT and solutions uh, in your org, start to kind of think about what happens when we add Marketo, what happens when we add NetSuite and all mm. of these other platforms, you know, what's our strategy going forward? Um, now, I wanna, I'm going to move on to our next poll here, but I do just want to let you all know that uh, we're looking at about 70-some percent of you saying that Microsoft 365 is, is really what you're, what you're thinking about when you're considering wow. uh, SaaS backup. So, yeah, that's uh, the vast majority. And then it's split about 15% um, uh, for Google and, and Salesforce, um, so it's, uh, or 13 and 14. So <laughs> uh, it's a, a pretty big majority going to Microsoft 365. Um, Satya and Adela did I've, something, right? That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just letting you know that I have put a new poll up on the screen. So if you uh, thought you were done, you're not. You have more homework from this session here. Please do take a second and, and let us know what additional information you would like to get about the spanning solutions. So obviously, obviously, Sean just gave us a great presentation, but we are just scratching the surface, and there's lots more to learn and explore here with this solution. So uh, take a minute now, click on the poll, and let them know. Rather than you having to do a bunch of work, they're just going to hand it right to you. What, what exactly would be the most helpful follow-up for you uh, when thinking about the presentation we just heard? So while you guys are clicking on that poll there, uh, I think Sean and I are going to dive into some questions. You ready for that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, I mentioned that there was a lot of questions coming in about AI, and, and I want to talk about that selfishly because I find it really fascinating. Sure. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did get one question, uh, kind of, and I'm going to sort of combine two questions here. The first question that came in was wondering if, if AI is going to bypass the pace that we can keep up with these securities. And then Paul asked a question that sort of uh, fringed alongside that. And, and the way he phrased this was, AI accelerated attacks could potentially affect both quality and quantity of attacks that can affect mm -hmm. specifically remote workers, um, and especially in the near future. So uh, wondering if you could shed some light on, on Spanning's backup solution and how that might protect data from these faster evolving attack vectors, and including, and you mentioned this quite a bit, Sean, the socially engineered. Yeah. 
So the, the social engineering thing that scares me is, is absolutely what you said about the scale. It becomes very easy to do this and, and hit a broad market. And what usually happens is, you know, you have spam filters and these traditional antivirus rules that are taught to recognize what a bad message or threat looks like. They memorize that and then they protect you from it. But if you have the AI that's constantly shifting, um, you know, it can bypass those things. Now, ironically, and I'll give you an ex a real example, people were using AI to cheat on their papers or, or hypothetically cheat on their papers. And what's pretty fun is in less than a year, as these AI came up to create, you know, um, uh, fake papers, people immediately started creating AI to recognize papers that were created by AI. So there's already yeah. an AI, yeah, there's already an AI on the other side. And so for example, you know, with our Graphis email protection, that's a place where we're, we're implementing AI um, very, very strongly. And what happens in that module, um, and, and it can be bundled with spanning, is effectively, we don't just look at it like a traditional spam filter, but we look at 50 plus attributes of things like where are people sending the messages from? Well, Sham doesn't typically send a message. You know, he's in New York or, or, or on the East Coast. He doesn't send emails at four in the morning and suddenly he's sending an email with an attachment in it. Or he typically doesn't send attachments. He loves Microsoft. He usually sends links, you know, all kinds of strange behavior, um, where the messages are coming from, what the body of that is, and, and a bunch of other stuff uh, like the metadata in the email can actually be crawled through and we create these AI profiles um, to kind of better detect and give you a spam filter that's kind of growing the more uh, the bad guys throw at you rather than mm -hmm. you just constantly having to keep up and, and get buried. So I think, you know, just like there's a scam artist who sees something and says, hey, I can, you know, I can do something with this um, and take advantage of people. There's a lot of good guys who see AI um, and, and do the same thing. And ultimately, Spanning's job is, you know, when that attack comes through. And a lot of times, I think we need to be humble. Um, you know, the, what, I, what I say in another presentation is the right script hasn't found mm -hmm. you yet, right? Um, because, sure, you might not be falling for the scam about your car's extended warranty anymore. Um, but if somebody messages you and speaks to you in a convincing way that they're from IT, and they pull you in, and now the AI chatbot gets replaced with a real scam person um, who takes mm -hmm. over and just kind of woos you through, that's very, very scary. Um, and so I do yeah. see lots of social engineering attacks coming up, but that's where training comes in. And when you look at the Uber attack, for example, um, the, the teenager literally messaged this employee on WhatsApp, a simple lesson like nobody in IT is ever going to ask you for anything on WhatsApp. Do not use WhatsApp <laughs> for anything corporate. Like that lesson alone could have prevented a nightmare from happening. So sometimes it's not even buying an expensive tool. It's just constantly reinforcing uh, um, training. And I'll say this, I receive um, spam phishing emails uh, to my account um, pretending to be from corporate. But ironically, when you hover over the link, the link was actually going to a Chase bank account, um, you know, uh, you know, link, and it was probably trying to log into my my site or whatever it might be. But uh. you can kind of see how the people attacking you in the public can bleed over into your corporate life, um, but also people scamming you in the corporate world could could bleed over into your into your public life and and hurt you in that way too. So that's how you kind of get the buy-in um, from your end users. Um, is kind of really make them understand the threat. It's not just this uh, boring, mandatory training. And uh, my last piece of <laughs> advice is, you know, if you don't want to do a boring, mandatory training, order pizza. Um, have people <laughs> come in for a lunch and learn. They'll actually pay attention and just teach them one or two things. Give them a fun lesson and, and just reinforce it uh, over time. But this is going to be a cultural thing, not just buying tools. You know, that's a great point, and I also selfishly have to add, if you don't want it to be boring, don't make it boring. You know, there's lots of ways. Yeah. I, I listen to you guys talk about this stuff all day, every day, and I am rarely to never bored. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of this is, is how we present and storytell, and there's 
some incredible stories to tell uh, about all of this, as as you just demonstrated for us, Sean. And, and thank you very much. I, I wish we could we could keep going with this particular session right now, uh, <laughs> but I think we'll have to wrap it there. Uh, but before you take off, um, if somebody out there is really looking to learn a little bit more about Spani or or ready to jump in, what do you recommend as their first step? Yeah, so definitely, um, you know, if you're not reaching out to us, maybe you're a little bit shy. Uh, or, or you're, you're brave and, and you're a self-starter, we provide a 14-day risk-free trial for all of our SaaS backup solutions. Um, you know, no credit card information, nothing like that is required, and you're able to test all of the features um, of the product. So definitely, if you're a go-getter, you do it yourself, check out our trials. We're in the respective app stores, the App Exchange, the Office Store, and, and the Marketplace. And, you know, when we do a demo, um, we're not just going to be looking at doing a demo with you, but if you want to talk about things like building a, um, you know, a recovery plan, qualifying for things like cyber insurance, we can expand into those areas. We don't just want to sell you stuff, but we want to make sure that you have a proper security posture. Perfect. Love that. Well, uh, Sham, again, thank you so much uh, for this incredible conversation, for sticking around to answer some questions. Um, and for anyone out there that asked a question that we didn't get to, we will make sure that the spanning team has a chance to respond live chat and, and email uh, in follow-up. So you will get some answers back. And, uh, and thank you again, Sham. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, with that, uh, we're going to kind of keep things rolling here, but I'm going to leave that poll up for just a second longer because first, first, now I know you all felt me gearing up for a prize and that's coming. But first, I do want to remind you all to keep checking that handouts tab. So there's an incredible ebook there from Spanning, Seven Key Steps to Quick Data Recovery. This is a really fun and interesting look at the causes and the consequences of data loss. Um, as well as talking about backups and recovery options, super interesting and, and an absolutely great follow-up to our conversation through the whole megacast and in particular what we just heard from Sham. So be sure you grab that ebook. You can download that and save that to read after we wrap. And now, I did say prize, let's do some prize giveaways. Now I'm going to give you a reminder, and you're going to hear me say this a lot today, you do need to be here present live at the Megacast in order to win. Uh, our very first lucky winner of a $500 Amazon gift card is Greg Middleton of Texas. Greg Middleton of Texas, you have won a $500 Amazon gift card. And you know what? I'm feeling a bit spicy. Let's go ahead and give away one of those grand prizes as well. Uh, so we, are, we have a, a couple of Apple iPhone 14 Pros. We have five of them here today we'll be giving away. So uh, let's give one away to Dick Cook. Dick Cook of Indiana, you have won an Apple iPhone 14 Pro. Uh, and so Greg, congrats on your gift card. Dick, on your phone. We'll follow up with both of you after we wrap the webinar today. Now don't forget there's still lots more chances to win one of those prizes plus that best question gift card from each session. So keep those questions coming in. And again, we take a look at those after we wrap. But for now, let's keep uh, moving things along and jump into our next presentation on the Megacast here because we are about to hear from an incredible team. Now, I know, I, I know you recognize some of these names here, and of course, Rubrik is always a favorite on the Megacast. Now, we're actually going to be hearing from Kim Lambert, Principal Product Marketing Manager at Rubrik, and we've got Joe here on live chat who's going to be answering some questions. Uh, Kim, thank you so much for being here with us today. I know that you have a lot of great information to cover, as always, so I will hand things right on over to you. Take it away, Kim. All right. Hey, everyone. Yes. Hi, Kim Lambert here. Thanks so much to everyone for taking time today to learn more about protecting your Microsoft environments. You know, as a product evangelist for cloud data security at Rubrik, this is one of my favorite topics. So today, here's what I want you to walk away knowing. If nothing else, I want you to, to understand how to be confident that your data is recoverable from cyber attack or, or even everyday data loss due to human error or whatnot. You know, why third-party protection for Exchange, OneDrive, SharePoint, Teams data within Microsoft 365 is absolutely critical. And then also what an automated holistic approach to data protection does to combat your cyber risk and you know, really make sure that you are resilient. So how do we at Rubrica do these things? How do we, how do we look at this? Well, 
At Rubrik, we provide a zero trust data security platform called Rubrik Security Cloud, which we've built from the ground up. And Rubrik Security Cloud helps customers around the world recover from cyber attacks and the actions of malicious insiders, as well as operational disruptions, all in the name of business continuity. And this makes your data across IaaS, PaaS, SaaS resilient. So wherever data lives, it's under a watchful eye where you can proactively monitor risks with powerful data observability capabilities like sensitive data discovery here, um, ransomware monitoring and investigation. Um, and of course, so that you can easily recover, you can remediate, um, recover that data at a moment's notice at scale. And to be able to offer some of these top-notch capabilities, you should know that Rubrik has partnered up with Microsoft for a combined zero trust approach to data security. So off the bat, you know that we're serious about helping customers secure their data in the public cloud. And Microsoft actually took an equity stake in Rubrik at the end of 2021. So we work very closely with them as a strategic partner. And this partnership works well because we have a joint vision to protect customers from cybersecurity threats. And this partnership, it actually puts us in an incredibly favorable position to help you. So in terms of innovation and a technical support interlock. And John Thompson, former chairman of Microsoft, actually sits on our board. So we're in lockstep, even starting at the top with, with access to senior executives at, at Microsoft. And Microsoft and, and Rubrik, they have, we have this better together story. Um, we go hand in hand in the sense that we already manage hundreds of petabytes on Azure. We have well over 2,500 joint customers, and we have this technology in place to secure your Microsoft data right alongside anything you have on-prem and in other cloud environments. Okay, so now, even though the shared responsibility model, everything, something, you know, that people have been talking about for years and we all know exists and, and still applies, with our partnership, Microsoft is now an established and an invested player at this point. So they're actually taking a stance on recovery. So they're working with Rubrik as a trusted third-party vendor for backup, which Microsoft even recommends, you can see here in their documentation, as the first step to ransomware recovery. Why? Um, you know, that's because, and you may be surprised to hear this, and we talk about this for Microsoft 365 a lot, is Microsoft provides no SLA for data recovery. Uh, because whether that's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or, or SaaS apps, that shared responsibility model for data protection says the onus lies on you, the customer, to back up and recover your data. And the complexity behind this comes into play, especially when operating in hybrid, multi-cloud, or at an enormous scale. Because as you may be well aware already, you may be finding this as your data in the cloud grows, it can become a bit of this more cloud, more problem scenario with the breadth of apps and services that you're running and using in the cloud. And we find that this hits people in your organization differently, you know, in, in different ways. With, with multi-cloud, someone has to be operationalizing backups across VMs, managed disks, uh, databases in the cloud. You know, we find that the infrastructure ops people want to be able to optimize costs so that they can you know, back up and quickly restore data and consolidate and simplify infrastructure. The cloud architects, on the other hand, you know, they, they want to build fast in the cloud. They may not be worried about things like data governance. Um, you know, you've also got the modern workplace owners to think about who just want their applications and their data available with, with no interruption. Um, security ops, they need to be able to feel confident in your organization's ability to, to recover the data. And then, of course, think about your CIO here. They just want to be able to approve uh, attack readiness. They want to be able to prove that they're ready. Um, and that can be really tough with a complex organizational structure and goals. So we are thinking about all of these, these folks in the organization to, to make sure that your organization is successful and being resilient. Because when it comes to infrastructure operations, you know, you think about it, a lot of times you've got multiple accounts to manage. Um, within cloud regions, you're going to need to be able to, to protect the data and set up different components around retention and frequency. You know, plus, when you're deploying resources within multiple regions for each account, you're also managing backups for all of those different regions as well. And of course, you know, don't forget about your data on-prem, too, that needs to be uh, protected as well. It needs the same governance and security if you operate in a, in a hybrid model. So 
all this becomes a lot to manage. It's manual. It's resource intensive. It, it doesn't scale. And that's just data protection uh, management. What about data security? What about being able to recover from secure, uncompromised backups? You know, it's a lot to think about. It can be difficult to maintain visibility into, you know, your dynamic data security and protection requirements. Um, your recovery processes are siloed. And in a ransomware scenario, you very well may have one cloud hit or multiple cloud environments as well as your data center. So when you think about protected, uh, protecting fragmented data environments in the cloud, you may think, okay, I don't have as much of a problem with all this now, um, but you have to consider too, hey, you know, maybe native tools are working for my AWS environment, but wait, I, you know, I'm also utilizing Microsoft 365 and, and I've heard other teams talk about building an Azure, you know, maybe you even have a, a GCP environment to consider. So with all these platforms, you may not have the right experience, technical resources in place to, you know, not only manage backup jobs, but also be able to rapidly recover from clean data snapshots in the case of ransomware somewhere. And we find that many customers we talk to have, have struggled to obtain this, this holistic view, and they have difficulty even generating the data recovery readiness proof that they need for the CIO. So whether it's reports they can deliver or a plan they can present to the board. And that's where we at Rubrik come in with Rubrik Security Cloud. So when it comes to cloud, we offer a three-pronged approach. So we drive automated protection with secure backups that are logically air-gapped, and they're removed from identity boundaries that can be breached. Second, you can get started quickly. It's easy to scale as your business grows without breaking the bank. So you can ensure your cloud security resources are protected as your cloud architects build fast. You know, with Rubrik Security Cloud, you're eliminating a lot of toil by consolidating the data management layer, simplifying protection with a Rubrik SLA domain policy, which is simply a set of policies that define at what frequencies backups should be performed, of the protected objects within Rubrik, you know, for how long should they be retained locally or with a replication partner or on the archival location. So with that capability, we drastically reduce the amount of operational impact it has on your team. And we've even got cloud tiering features to optimize storage costs in the process. You're managing everything through a single UI. All of this data is across all of your clouds, on-prem, rather than managing silos of management points and, and deploying different resources in the cloud, we're consolidating it all. So this gives you a defined baseline backup across all resources, cloud and data center for fast recovery when you need it. And when deploying cloud protection, even if you're coupling that with on-prem appliances or software delivered globally, that central management plane for data resilience, observability, and remediation can help you de-risk cloud. You know, you can even assess potential PII, HIPAA data, you know, other classified data exfiltration risk with, you know, with things like sensitive data discovery for, for data and, and workloads like Microsoft 365. And you can fast track reporting across IaaS and PaaS. So these services we offer actually do three main functions. First, you know, Rubrik has the ability to archive, to secure storage with, uh, with the option of a Rubrik managed service um, built on Microsoft Azure that is called Rubrik Cloud Vault. And that provides an isolated offsite data archival. Um, you can also use storage tiering for AWS and Azure for, for lower cost, long-term cloud storage. And by design, our, our storage tiering capability is actually what provides immutable backups for your Azure VMs and, and managed disks because it, it utilizes um, native Azure blob immutability. Now, we also have the ability to launch existing applications in the cloud, so that accelerates the move away from your, your on-prem infrastructure um, by instantiating your, your VMs and applications. And then finally, here on the right, we secure cloud-native applications across clouds with, with protection for all your popular workloads like EC2, RDS, Azure SQL. And of course, Microsoft 365 as well. So I feel like I need to cover this um, you know, because for so many of, uh, of the customers that we talk to, so many organizations, Microsoft 365 has become not only a tier one application and critical to, to operations, but also now a huge target for attackers. That's why it's so important to talk about this. You know, attackers know that this is where they can hit you hard. And while Microsoft does provide data security and thinking about perimeter security, data governance, Rubrik is on, is on hand there for the recovery piece. So whether it's for ransomware recovery, recovery from accidental deletion, or you know, even just having a tool for long-term retention for everyday instances where you need to recover 
60, 90 day old data that's been lost and, and you can't recover it with Microsoft native tools alone. That's where we come in. So while Microsoft 365 does have functionality to help you control access, right? Like they, they focus on this, keeping attackers out. Um, they've got compliance tools like retention policies to help you schedule deletion. So you don't keep data longer than you need. In reality, tools like this, like retention hold can be misused. Think about an account takeover to delete data, you know, or data can be deleted by accident when the compliance policies are, are not maybe well understood within the organization. So think about that. That can actually be a tool used against you. Um, Microsoft also has classification and, and, and search tools like litigation hold to help you with compliance and, and e-discovery. Um, but legal hold is, is not designed to be a backup and recovery fail safe. And, and Microsoft actually only recommends using it for a subset of your data. But with Rubric, we can make sure that there is an isolated copy of all your data in Azure, but physically separated from the Microsoft 365 tenant and solution. So you can recover in bulk or, or use a granular three-step recovery to any destination and, and easily locate data with, with real-time global search. So um, recovery at scale for Microsoft 365 is, is made available with Azure Kubernetes service where Rubrik stands up separate containers for every backup job. And that way the system scales automatically based on the, the workload demand. So we can, we can help multiple customers um, recover at scale at the same time. So you've got that protection for your Microsoft 365 data um, as well within the SaaS-based Rubrik Security Cloud. And I'd like to reinforce here that Rubrik Security Cloud actually offers a real differentiator um, to our customers, and, and that is immutability in the cloud to even further protect your backup data with immutable backups for Azure Managed Disks, um, immutable and air gap backups for Azure VMs, so that you got that ransomware resiliency for Azure deployments, um, those air gap backups for Microsoft 365. And I'll, I mentioned, you know, we also have air gap backups for AWS, RDS, um, for our Amazon Web Services customers to, to protect from AWS account compromise. And then added to this is our ability to leverage object lock on, on AWS S3 too. So that creates a, a worm lock capability there. We've also got air-gapped cross-subscription portable backups for Azure SQL, and that can help protect uh, you against rogue administrators or ransomware. And this is a big deal for, for those of you out there who have or, or will migrate from on-prem SQL Server because we do offer point-in-time recoverability for Microsoft Azure SQL. And the way that we do that in the most secure way is by taking database snapshots that are stored in a separate hardened subscription where we then take worm locks on the uploaded data so that we can ensure that it remains secure. Um, now for Azure SQL portability is a big benefit there because we offer that so that your data can be recovered to a different location if there is a case of compromise or, or even if you're just doing dev test in a, in, a, in a sandbox environment. So keep in mind that today, the only way to protect Azure SQL with Azure Backup Service currently requires some, a little bit of complex management where you have to go inside each server, create policies inside each one. And that's why with Rubrik Security Cloud, you have this fully baked policy model to, to automate your protection and, and it lets you restore in and across regions, back up pretty much as often as you like and institute things like tag-based SLAs. But how does protection for all these workloads we've been talking about, including Azure SQL, fit into your whole security strategy? Well, when you think about enterprise, it's really around adding multiple layers of, of protection so that you, you know, they can converge in a threat scenario. So you've got perimeter security, network security, endpoint application security. But it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when these layers are going to be breached. So thinking about all the things that Microsoft provides, no matter how much you've invested in them and ingrained yourself in the data security capabilities of cloud vendors like Microsoft. For infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, for example, think about if you're moving your traditional on-prem SQL Server databases over to Azure SQL. Just migrating to the cloud alone doesn't mean that there's going to be data security in place. So, you know, for instance, know that right now that limited native backup functionality that, that Microsoft Backup Service has, you know, it, it's, it's having you go inside each server, create policies inside each, and why does that matter? Well, you know, you need to know that, hey, if a new database comes up, 
you have to manually go in and set up policies. What if someone creates a new database without you knowing? You know, bam, there's a, there's a new hole in your, in your data security. So it's, you know, it's important to have something more comprehensive there. And when you think about the SaaS space though, security layers that are part of that traditional defense and the depth strategy, they're actually managed by your SaaS based platform vendors. So it's why you make the switch to SaaS in the first place to make your life easier. But this also has the effect of putting security out of your purview. And, and keep in mind, enterprise security is, is different for SaaS, right? So the security layers for SaaS actually become identity and authentication layers, where the main entry point for threat actors is your user credentials, your logins. That's how malicious users gain access. So you have the tools that Microsoft provides, of course, which, which we talked about, you know, that native Microsoft 365 tool set, you know, they provide for, for Microsoft 365 retention policies, um, litigation hold for a subset of your data, plus even the recycle bin with, you know, varying times of retention across the different 365 applications. But if the identity and security layers are breached and admin credentials are compromised, you're out of luck without a secure backup plan. So rubric fits in there as a critical part of your defense and depth strategy. So if those top layers are breached, you now have that logical secure air gap between your core data and your backup data that is protected by rubric. So even when your security defenses fail, you know, your data is still protected. You're resilient. You have a secure backup from which you can restore your data and you have a strategy to quickly recover to keep your organization running. So to wrap up, we talked about securing your backups with a secure logical air gap, achieving a baseline backup across hybrid and, and multi-cloud and, and unifying your visibility in the process. Rubrik has your back for data security, especially if you need to secure your, your critical Microsoft environment against data loss. Um, our team really looks forward to, to hopefully working with you. Um, in the meantime, check out some of our most popular resources. We'll make that available, and including white papers on uh, Rubrik Zero Trust for Microsoft, um, a pretty hot off the press updated version of our, our Microsoft 365 architecture and, and security white paper where you can dig into all of those details as well. All right, so let's do Q&A. First question, do you know how many businesses protect their 365 data versus those that use Microsoft out of the box protection? Yeah, we see that uh, to be about 74%. Uh, I, I know that because we put that on slides a lot, um, according to, uh, to third party research from, from ESG. So um, in actuality, our team sees closer to about 85% in a lot of our, our conversations with, with customers, though. So people really are, really are thinking about this and, and protecting that Microsoft 365 data with, with third party protection. Next question, why did Microsoft partner with Rubrik versus other vendors? Yeah, a great question. So, you know, our counterparts at Microsoft, uh, I've heard this from them, they, they say that there are several key differentiators with Rubrik that, that drove their decision to partner with us. So first, that very large overlap of joint customers. You know, we're looking at almost about 3,000 today, um, getting about there, growing rapidly. Um, simple customer experience. They found it to be the most API first, cloud first platform, and that allows a lot of automation and easy leveraging of the cloud. Um, they also said our, our great focus on security. We are a data security company. Um, we've got some market first capabilities with sensitive data discovery, ransomware monitoring and investigation. Um, and uh, finally, our, our modern, modern SaaS architecture. So Rubrik Security Cloud frees up customers from the burden of, of deploying backup infrastructure for workloads. So all of that led uh, Microsoft to, uh, to partner with Rubrik. All right, question. Can't Microsoft restore data within 14 days? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, think about Microsoft 365. So that, that's correct. You know, I'll echo the words of, of one of our technical counterparts over at Microsoft, and we, we present frequently with, with them um, in saying that, that, yes, Microsoft has a native recycle bin. They've got policies to restore your data. But um, you know, most sophisticated ransomware attacks are discovered well beyond that time frame. Um, and in that time frame, assets can get affected, deleted uh, progressively, which, which can make the restore process much, much harder to manage. So because of that, you really do need third-party protection like Rubrik Security Cloud. 
All right, question. With the air gap for Microsoft, is there pen testing to make sure it's secure? Sure, sure. So with the logical air gap, um, the air gapping is provided by data hosted in a rubric managed environment that's uh, that's built on top of Microsoft's um, secure and, and durable Azure blob storage platform. So, you know, full architecture and performance uh, reviews per the, um, the well architected framework from Microsoft um, you do ensure that they're continuing enhancements and, and uh, confirmation of the security and compliance of, of the rubric solutions built on Microsoft. Um, that is something that I, I know they do. Um, from the rubric side, we do leverage a, a third party to, to pen test the environment on a regular basis, um, along with a, a multitude of other security controls, which, which our team can, can definitely discuss with you uh, directly so that we can get all of your questions answered there. All right, question. For the air gap between my own Azure tenant and the rubric Azure tenant, if a bad actor breached my own tenant, would they be able to elevate themselves to be able to delete my data stored in rubric? Okay, all right, so this is another air gap question. Um, and you're, you're asking if, um, all right, in, the, in this situation, yeah, all right. The, the answer is, is no. <laughs> First of all, if a bad actor breached your own Azure tenant, would they be able to, uh, to delete data stored in, in within rubrics tenant? Okay, so th there's no way to, to access the backup data with your Azure credentials. So the Azure identity is separated from the identity you'll, you'll use to log into the managed rubric Azure tenant. So this means if a bad actor breaches your uh, your Azure tenant, your rubric account and, and therefore your backups are, are still secure. And you know, think about that. This is actually really better than provisioning an Azure storage account or any storage infrastructure connected to your environment. Um, you know, identity separation is, is absolutely key and, and we provide that. Oh, okay. It looks like maybe we lost Kim right at the end there, um, but I think we were getting close to the end of our Q&A time. So uh, we'll get her back on and, and we'll have her uh, do some, some live chatting here. Uh, and I know there's still quite a few questions that we did not get to, but we are right at the end of our time here. Uh, so thank you so much to Kim uh, in absentia for that awesome presentation. Uh, lots of great information. And I know that that was resonating with you as well because uh, I can see all the questions coming in. So again, we'll, we'll get uh, Kim back here on live chat and, uh, and keep that rolling. And please do keep in mind that if we do not get an answer back to you on live chat today, you know, sometimes it's just not the easiest uh, uh, answer format and time goes by quickly. So no worries, we will make sure that all the questions get to the rubric team. Uh, and so you will get follow up. So please do keep those questions coming in because you are going to get some answers back to that. Uh, and in the meantime, you can see I've put up that poll question. Uh, so what we're looking for here is what additional information you would like to get about the rubric solution. Obviously, Kim gave us some great information, but it is again, you know, high level. There's a lot to cover. So, uh, and I know, as I said, lots of questions here. So one great way to make sure that you get an answer back is to uh, click on that poll there, answer that poll, and let Rubric know what they can send you to make sure that you get the information that you need. I'm also going to suggest if you haven't done this already, please head on over to that handouts tab that we keep coming back to um, and make sure that you get the technical white paper from Rubric. It's the Rubric Security Cloud, How It Works, Cloud Native Protection for Azure VMs. Now this is a great way to get familiar with the architecture and workflows of Rubric's Cloud Native Protection for Microsoft Azure. So if that's something you're thinking about, please do uh, make sure that you click on that link and save that for later because you're going to want to read that. I promise you, uh, as much as you want to retain all the information we just heard, you won't. Uh, so <laughs> grab that resource and, and uh, take a look at that a little bit later. While you are uh, filling out the poll and grabbing that handout, I'm going to go ahead and give away a couple of more prizes. Why not? Hey, we're, we're having a good time here. So let's start with a $500 Amazon gift card. Uh, and I'm going to remind you that you do need to be here present with us at the Megacast in order to win. Our next winner of a $500 Amazon gift card is Maria Lopez of Texas. Maria Lopez of Texas. 
And again, let's uh, let's give away another one of those Apple iPhone 14 Pros. I don't know why they keep making these long, huge titles that I have to say every time. Apple iPhone 14 Pro. Uh, we're going to give away another one of those to John Adika of Washington, D.C. John Adika, Adika of Washington, D.C. Uh, congratulations on your shiny new Apple iPhone 14 Pro. And to Maria on your $500 Amazon gift card. Now, lots more chances to win, so don't give up yet. There are still chances to win one of those phones and those gift cards. And we also have that best question card coming in from each session. And again, we're going to review that after we wrap. So you want to make sure you get those questions in uh, also because, hey, it, uh, it just makes everything a little bit more fun, folks, right? All right. Well, I think speaking of fun, we will move things along into our next presentation because I know you are all going to enjoy this one. I'm very excited to introduce you to our next presenter on the Megacast, Ken Huffman, Data Protection Solution Business Manager at HPE or Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Ken, so excited to have you here with us today. Uh, I know that we uh, wanted to leave some questions uh, or time for questions at the end. So without any further ado, take it away, Ken. All right. Uh, Jess, thank you, and thank you, Actual Tech Media. Uh, my name is Ken Huffman. I am the Solution Business Manager for HPE Data Protection Products, uh, and we're going to talk about most of my products today. Um, and so let's dive right in. All right, so here's a, a little look at the agenda. Um, so we're going to do a little intro like I just did, uh, talk about HPE Data Protection, uh, take a look at a little, little landscape of data protection. Uh, then we're going to get into an, a Zerto overview, GreenLake Cloud Platform and Data Services, and then GreenLake for Backup and Recovery and GreenLake for Disaster Recovery. So we got quite a bit to cover, um, but it's all kind of cloud native stuff and exciting uh, products that HPE has. So real quick on data protection, um, I, I cover this because you know it's a, it's an umbrella term that we use within HPE to really cover the gamut of you know protecting your data, um, and so you can see the. Um, data protection methods are generally backup, snapshot, and replication, and that that was true, you know, 10 years ago, still true today. Um, you can see our product lines there. We've got Store Ever, which is tape products. Uh, Store Once is a disk-based backup appliance. Uh, Zerto, we're going to cover today. It's continuous data protection, and we'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, data protection as a service uh, is an interesting term because we actually have data protection as a service through our GreenLake organization, but I'm talking about the as a service uh, piece there specifically. And then lastly, um, under the other category, um, we HPE don't have all the technology in the industry and we know that. So we've got um, what we call HPE complete and it com completes our portfolio. That's why we call it that. And it's the beams, the convolts, the cohesities, things like that. So let's look at the landscape real quick. Um, I'm not going to stay on the next two slides. I'm just going to touch on because you guys live this. Um, this is your world. You know the challenges. And I'm assuming that the customer asks that we have there are many of your asks as well, um, just to kind of a primer to get you in that data protection mindset. And the next slide is um, how many points of administration do you have today? Um, every customer is different. This is probably an extreme example. It's showing nine points of administration. I doubt you guys have nine, but the point is that there are often many points of administration and that just adds to complexity. So let's dive into Zerto. And this is uh, the Zerto standalone product is what I'll call it. It's not, this. we will we'll have this via our cloud console, but this is the standalone product. We acquired Zerto uh, a little over a year ago and uh, it's an amazing product. I, I, I've represented Zerto, you can see my, my Sure, there we go. Um, for three, a little over three years now, um, and it's been great. Um, so this is the one slide I would ever use to talk to Zerto. If I had one slide to use, this would be it. And I'll direct your eyes to the colored boxes there. Um, so that's really what Zerto delivers. Uh, disaster recovery, um, ransomware recovery, Zerto's huge with that. Long-term retention, it does have the backup capability. Data mobility and migrations, it's amazingly simple to move workloads with Zerto whether it's cloud or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, test and development and security and compliance are a little esoteric, um, but additional things that Zerto can uh, assist with. And then below that, continuous data and workload protection. So CDP is a pretty well-known term in the industry, and hopefully uh, Zerto may have coined that, I don't know that, but um, CDP is really about replication. Um, 
you know, taking your data from one place and replicating it to another so you can fail over if needed. Um, and then below that is really important and very relevant to what we're talking about today. And that is where does Zerto play? And you can see Azure, Google Cloud, AWS. So the, the major clouds Zerto absolutely supports. Um, then you can see the bottom left is VMware and you can see Hyper-V as well. Uh, Zerto plays in virtualized environments. Um, it does not do bare metal. That's one caveat and one you know, downside to Zerto is that it won't do bare metal but you know, the, the prevalent uh, virtualized environments. And then if you look at the other logos, you can see uh, Kubernetes, right? So what Zerto does for virtualized environments, it does for containerized environments. Now that, that feature launched a year ago, June. Yeah, a year ago, June. Um, so Zerto is a really complete product for uh, disaster recovery, business continuity. And let me talk just a little bit of detail because I understand I've got some pretty smart people listening in here. So this is the second slide that I would use for Zerto, hence why I'm using it. Uh, it's the Zerto difference. And Zerto truly is a different product from most in the market. Um, and it will start, start at the top left and work around the clock. So continuous replication, I mentioned that already. Um, so continuous replication is, is near synchronous by design. It is not synchronous replication. Uh, synchronous replication you know, offers you uh, zero RTO and very low, I'm sorry, zero RPO and very low RTOs but uh, it's also very brittle, it can break. Uh, Zerto does near synchronous replication so that if your WAN link you know, saturates or is cut or something, uh, they can cache on the, the production side until that remedies. So near synchronous by design, moving around, uh, we don't just replicate data, we replicate your entire workload. And it's not just re replicated to a data store, it's replicated to a journal. And think of the journal like a DVR. If you're watching a TV show, and you miss a scene, you can rewind prior to that and catch that, you know, catch that scene again. Same thing with your data. Uh, if something happens, if, if there's a file deletion, very importantly, if there's ransomware deployment, you can rewind prior to that event and recover your workloads from that point, you know, prior to the ransomware being deployed and literally be back up and running in a matter of a couple of minutes. So um, bottom right application consistency, I talked about the workload. So Zerto protects groups of VMs together and employs right order fidelity so that you have application consistency. Um, so again, it's not just data, it's not just AVM, it's groups of VMs with right order fidelity. Uh, and then lastly, at the bottom left, Zerto is a single product. It's not multiple modules that you're licensing and deploying. It's a single user interface that has two different licensing models. I'm not gonna get into that, but it, it enables and disables features, not it doesn't change the product, it doesn't require another interface. So that is Zerto. Now we're gonna dive into the GreenLake Cloud Platform. This is the exciting um, birth of our vision for about two or three years. And that vision from our CEO was, we need to be the edge to cloud, everything as a service company, and we've got that now. So um, this is a look at the GreenLake Cloud Platform. You can see that green box, that, that's the foundation. And what we've got on top of that is networking, compute, and storage, the three pillars of IT. And networking's been around a lot longer, uh, if you know Aruba Central. Uh, and compute, or compute has been there a little bit longer than storage. We're, we're kind of the new kid on the block. And so we have some services out there and we've got more planned and announced and coming. Um, but you can see that the, the platform has a ton on top of it as well, workload orchestration, data management services. You got on the left, it's built on security, security and compliance. And then on the right, you can package this into a fully managed by us kind of a service if you want. So um, very capable platform and let's dive into the uh, details. So if you go to greenlake.hpe.com, uh, this is what you'll see. You can log in, anybody can create an account. So you can go out there and create an account, take a look. Um, but this is the main page and you'll see the Aruba that's networking data services is what I'm talking about today. <clears throat> Compute Ops Manager. And then lastly, GreenLake Central. If you're familiar with HPE, GreenLake has been around uh, I think over three years now. And so we were kind of first to the market with that. So everything GreenLake is available via this console. And if you click on um, data services, this is what pops up. And so these are the tiles that are active today. And actually there's, if you can see it, HCI is one of the tiles. That is, uh, it's not launched, but it is on the platform. You can onboard your DHCI units into GreenLake if you'd like. Um, and I'll show you another slide about that that's kind of slick. But the fact is you can see which tiles are there. GreenLake for backup and recovery is what I'm talking about today. We've got for block. We've got data ops manager. Um, so several features or services available today. 
Um, <clears throat> but importantly, this is a screenshot of GreenLake for HCI. And I show you this because this is the HCI manager interface for managing your DHCI deployments, you know, for performance, uh, utilization, all those various metrics. The red box in the top right is what I'll lead you to. And uh, you may not be able to read it, but it says protection. So the exciting thing there is um, my counterpart who does HCI uh, pulled me aside six weeks, maybe two, two months ago. And he said, hey, Ken, there's a really cool thing I can show you. And I took this screenshot. So basically the, the purpose behind this is you've got this GreenLake Cloud Platform, one-stop shop, single user interface. And if you've got, if you've onboarded DHCI into the HCI manager and you've got backup and recovery license, um, any future workloads that you, you create, the last step of that um, process is how do you want to protect this? And it's because of backup and recovery there. So we've integrated services together on the platform. So single user interface uh, for simplicity. This is a little bit nuts and bolts, but I think it's of value. So our, our cloud platform, how is it built? What is it? What are the, the pizza pieces and parts? So this is kind of a layer cake at the bottom. Well, first off, uh, green boxes are products that are available. They've launched. The red boxes are products that have been announced and are coming uh, literally in the next few months. So um, the layer cake, the bottom layer, it says infra infrastructure. So that's the hardware. Those are our uh, HPE arrays. So the emission critical is Electra 9000, if you know them. Business critical is Electra 6000, and general purpose is a Electra 5000. But they're just hardware. They can't do anything without being enabled with infrastructure services sitting on top of them. So uh, block service enables the arrays to st uh, serve up blocks. Fleet manager allows you to manage multiple arrays, again, via that single console. And then you need cloud data services, so you can store data, so you can analyze it, move it, protect it. And that's what we're talking about today, backup and recovery. So that service is available today. And you can see the red boxes right next to it, disaster recovery is coming. And that's why I talked about Zerto. So disaster recovery, green light for disaster recovery is just Zerto under the covers. So um, that's gonna be onboarded soon into the platform. So you can have full stack data protection. So lower tier with backup and recovery service and your top tier workloads with, uh, with, Zer with green light for disaster recovery. Uh, and we've got HCI, HCI service coming, storage fabric manager for your fiber channel switches. Um, so yeah, platform is building out. So backup and recovery. Um, so we built this service with a few things in mind. Number one on the left, simple deployment. Um, again, it only protects, well, I haven't told you this yet. Uh, it only protects VMware environments, we'll get to that. But um, all you're doing is deploying two different VMs on your, your vCenter. And so it's very quick to deploy. Automated protection. Um, there are two things that you do once you've deployed. You create protection groups. So you group VMs together based upon what you wanna, how you wanna protect them. And then you create protection policies that you apply to those protection groups. Those protection policies are standard data protection things. It's the, um, you know, uh, uh, incrementals, fulls, it's, is it daily, weekly, monthly? What's the retention period? Is it immutable? You set those policies up, you apply them to groups and you're done. Uh, any future VMs that you deploy, you put into a protection group, the policy is already applied to that group. So it, that new VM is protected according to that policy. Uh, managed from anywhere. I've been talking about a single cloud, cloud console, cloud interface. Um, you can, you know, whether it's a tablet, a desktop, a laptop, whatever, uh, you can manage from anywhere. And then lastly, on the right, no need to plan upgrades. And we, we do all that for you in the background via microservices uh, with no downtime. So um, that is all controlled by us. That uh, deploys features. You may, um, we just had a feature release I'll, I'll talk about, which is um, backup to cloud. Um, so you could all of a sudden see a, a valid backup target is a data store out in AWS. So that is the kind of stuff that we'll deliver via those um, background upgrades. Um, so this is a look at backup and recovery service. So it protects, um, uh, in, well, instant recovery via local snapshots. Then we've got rapid recovery via on-prem backups. And then you can push those backups off to the cloud for long-term retention. And keyword there is push. Um, you do have to look back up locally, then push it off. That is gonna change here in just a second. Um, and then we announced any storage. So before this, um, before we announced any storage, you could only do snapshots and backups to HPE storage. Now we have any storage. So it's the entirety of our portfolio as well as competitors products like uh, Pure, NetApp, EMC, things like that. Um, you can do the local backups to those storage devices, pretty much any block device. 
then um, we announced at our Discover event um, last July, we announced protection of AWS EC2 compute and EBS volumes. So native AWS workloads you can protect with backup and recovery service. The next slide is really gonna paint a picture as to why, but the fact is backup and recovery service has uh, really uh, efficient source site dedupe and compression. So that's why you would wanna protect those workloads out in AWS with us. We, I'll show you the efficiency here in just a second. Uh, importantly, no ingress or egress fees. That's built into the per gig per month cost in our uh, our pricing sheet. So you don't have any surprises if you have a mass restore. At some point, it's just a flat rate per month per gig. Um, that little arrow that just popped in there, that's the new feature. So um, it goes directly from on-prem to the cloud. So you no, no longer need to back up locally and then push that off to the cloud. You can back up directly to, uh, to AWS. And it, yeah, moving on. So here uh, it says up to 5X better capacity efficiencies than other solutions. So that's not, you're not getting 5X space savings period, you're getting 5X better efficiencies than other products. So the, it's something called a catalyst protocol. And you know we've seen the 20 to one compaction ratios, but um, ours is, is, if it's not the best in class, it's near the top. And so we can perform 5X better than uh, competing products and that's, uh, a very compelling part of our product there. Um, so back up every free trial, this is critical. Um, 90 day free trial, unlimited VMs protected and up to five terabytes in the cloud. Uh, there's a link right there uh, that you can click to to get that. And uh, please try the product out, it's pretty slick. You know, I've talked kind of through it. You can deploy this yourself and, uh, and uh, test, you know, backing up to the cloud. All right. Uh, then we're just going to build up. This is the end of the story, kind of. So I talked about Zerto. I've talked about GreenLake for ba backup and recovery, and I've run through the GreenLake Cloud Platform. So this is the end state. This is the end of the story, and it's coming probably in the May timeframe. This is when GreenLake for Disaster Recovery launches. So like I said, I talked about full stack data protection. You've got Zerto protecting, or not Zerto, GreenLake for DR, which is Zerto under the covers, protecting your top tier workloads, and then backup and recovery protecting the rest, all via one console, global policies for protection. Um, you know, and we're thinking back to that nine points of administration. Here's your one, that, that's what this is all about. Um, and then I just wanted to touch on our portfolio. Um, like we talked earlier, we do have uh, tape. Um, this isn't necessarily a cloud play, but the point is we've got a, a fully built portfolio. So here's our entire line of uh, tape products, anywhere from drives to full boat, you know, data center libraries. Um, and then we've got store once I mentioned, this is a disk based backup um, target. And we just launched the uh, latest generation of this about a year ago. And that's what those top three models are. So those, that's a disk based backup product. And then lastly, I talked about HPE Complete. This is an, an idea of, of how you can work with HPE to meet your needs. You may be a, a big fan of Veeam or Commvault or Coacity, and that's okay. So on the left side, you're talking top tier workloads, you want disaster recovery, very quick ransomware recovery, things like that. You know, Our recommendation is Zerto. We think, I personally think it's the best product for it. But if you have a preference for something else, that's fine. Go ahead and do a Veeam for that, if that's your call. On the right side is your lower tier workloads. It's rapid rapid recovery, not uh, disaster recovery. It's cost efficient protection, uh, unified software as a service kind of thing. Then you choose backup and recovery service unless you're not protecting VMware mm -hmm. or you have a, a preference for something else. Then we've got that in our portfolio as well. We can, we can build that out. So uh, just important point there. Um, and here we're coming towards the end. Uh, this is a reminder. I just talked about Discover in the announcement we had last July for backup and recovery. Discover 2023 is coming up. You can see there it's June 19th and 20th. Um, as usual, it's in Las Vegas as we've done for the past few years. So uh, please keep that in mind. And there's a registration link down there at the bottom. And then the last slide I have is just simply some resources. So these are resources you can click on. There are YouTube videos, there are demos, and a whole bunch of, of course, uh, documentation and, and uh, assets like that. All right, uh, now that we're done, let's flip back to the Discover slide and then uh, let's see, Jess, if there's any Q&A that we need to address. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, such an interesting presentation, Ken. Thank you so much for taking the time to kind of walk us through and, and dig in a little bit further. Uh, you know, what's what's going on at HPE? Uh, obviously, the answer is lots. 
uh, which is really exciting. And uh, the Discover session, I'm, I'm really pumped about this. Uh, as if we need another excuse to go hang out in Vegas, but there's uh, there's some really cool information there. So uh, I'm glad you've got some uh, some early registration and information coming out for the audience there. Um, for those of you out there that are asking questions, keep those coming in. We're going to get through as many of them as we can right now. And then, as I've said, we're going to make sure that those go to Ken. So any that we don't get to cover, uh, we will make sure that the HPE team has an opportunity to follow up with you. Uh, Ken, speaking of, let's let's dive in, hey? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start with this one here because I think there's been a few questions I've seen coming in around this. So um, I'm going to snag uh, this one here. Does Zerto support the Google Cloud Platform? Uh, okay, good question. That uh, has two answers. Uh, so the answer is really no, <clears throat> but importantly, we do support Google Cloud VMware Engine. So. GCP no, but Google Cloud VMware Engine yes. I like. I like. We have a we have a full answer for you, but no. <laughs> but then fuzzy around the edges there. That's good. Uh, okay. How about um, do backup and recovery and Zerto share technologies? Uh, no, they are uh, two very distinct products. Um, two yeah, two different technologies uh, that have, we put together on the cloud platform. Okay, I like it. They skipped that day in kindergarten when we learned about sharing. Uh, okay, is my existing store once appliance compatible with Zerto and or backup and recovery? Yes, absolutely. So this is something that backup and recovery and Zerto do kind of share, and that is they support hmm. store once as a backup target, both, both backup and recovery and Zerto do. Perfect. Okay. I like these nice, easy answers. You're knocking them out, Ken. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's get to this last one here. Uh, is Zerto able to protect cloud native workloads? Uh, yeah. If I understand the question correctly, I, I, I think, let me, I'll, I'll set a scenario for you. So you're running workloads on-prem and you're cloud curious. You can deploy Zerto, uh, protect to, let's use AWS as an example, protect to an AWS region, and then uh, protect to a different region within AWS and run your workload from AWS and protect to AWS. So yes. Perfect, I love that. I think we should all be a little more curious in our days, so that's great. Um, okay, Ken, well, I really wish we could keep going because there's a lot of great questions coming in, uh, but I think we are gonna have to wrap it up pretty quick here. Before we let you go though, for anyone out there that has uh, has really fallen in love with HPE, wants to get started, wants to learn a little bit more about how this might work for their organization, um, short of you know heading to Vegas in the summer, uh, what what is a good first step? How do they get started? Well, yeah, so I think hpe.com, of course, um, will get you to, the, to everything, but greenlake.hpe.com is really easy to remember to get you to the, to the GreenLake, GreenLake Cloud Platform. Um, there's um, uh, Discover. You can see that up on the screen right now, hpe.com slash discover, very easy to get to. So yeah, all of those. A lot of really great ways to uh, to connect, to get more info. Uh, again, thank you so much, Ken, for, for being here with us today, for the great presentation, and definitely for taking some time to answer some audience questions today. I know we've all learned a ton, and it has just been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks for having me, Jess, and Actual Tech. Okay, now I've actually just navigated back to Ken's slide with all the links and resources because I did see a few comments coming in that, that you weren't able to get to the links fast enough. So um, I'm going to leave that up for a second before we jump into our poll. Um, so please do take a second. If you wanted to get some of those uh, follow-up links that Ken just mentioned, uh, click on that resource slide that you see up on the screen. And I'm going to give you another couple of seconds before I, uh, I put the poll question up here. And so in a second, when I put that poll up, what I'm going to be asking you is what is the additional information you would like to get from HPE? And so when you're thinking Zerto, you're thinking GreenLink, you're thinking HPE, um, all of the wonderful things that we just heard from Ken, and there was a lot, and as you can see, there's still a lot more resources to explore. Uh, what additional information would you like? What would be helpful to you? Um, I see Michael has said good links. I agree, Michael. That's a great resource slide. Please do take advantage of them. 
uh, Benjamin saying, thanks, Ken. I'm going to pass that on to Ken as well. All right, I'm going to move over to that poll there. So uh, every, if everyone can take a moment uh, and make sure that you do fill that out, again, a great way to uh, let the team know how they can follow up with you, what additional information you would like to get, uh, because obviously there's way more than any one of us can take in. So this is you hitting the easy button and making your life a little bit simpler. Um, I'm also going to remind you to head on over to uh, the Handouts tab if you haven't done that already. Uh, make sure you can uh, click on all the links, but if you click on the, the HPE link that you'll see there, you can start exploring data protection as a service. Um, and their whole thing is effortless and secure. So that's that's great, right? That's what we're here for, effortless and secure. They have a 90-day free trial, uh, so you can really make sure that you get in the sandbox and get to spend a little time playing. So make sure you click on that link, click on the poll, and while you're doing that, I will go ahead and give away another prize. Now this time we're going to do a $500 Amazon gift card to someone lucky here with us live at the Megacast today. So this $500 Amazon gift card is going to Andrew Romanesco of Tennessee. Andrew Romanesco of Tennessee, you have won a $500 Amazon gift card. Congratulations. And as always, we will be in touch about claiming your prize after we wrap today. Now there are still more chances to win plus that best question card from each session. So make sure you're getting those questions in because even if we didn't get it to it at the end of the, the last sessions or the upcoming sessions, you're still entered to win just by asking that question. So make sure you get those in. All right, well, we're going to keep things moving along here. So make sure you do get that poll filled out. But I cannot wait to get into our next presentation. So I'm going to move things ahead because we are going to be hearing from the wonderful Julia First Morgado, Product Strategy Technologist at Veeam. Julia, thank you so much for being here with us. I know the Veeam crew always has absolutely fantastic presentations. So I'm going to step back and, and hand the mic right on over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I'm really excited. So let's get started. Um, I'm Julia and I'm a global technologist in the product strategy team at Veeam and I focus mainly on the public cloud, uh, AWS to be more specific, and Kubernetes. I also post a lot on Twitter and LinkedIn, so if you want to connect, my handle is Julia S. Morgado. Feel free to check out my content and, and connect with me. So now let's talk about cloud native. What is cloud native? I'm going to be honest that when I got into tech more than five years ago, I used to use the terms cloud and cloud native interchangeably, but they aren't the same. Cloud computing, or cloud for short, is the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. And cloud native is a term used to describe software that is built to run in a cloud computing environment. These applications are designed to be scalable, highly available, and easy to manage. So when you have cloud computing plus cloud native, that's when the digital transformation happens. Almost all major business organizations are going cloud native nowadays. So just to give a few examples, companies like Netflix, Uber, and WeChat have already adopted cloud native technologies, which helps them boost business strategy and increase value. These are large well-known brands, but the process and principles remain the same to all size organizations. So it doesn't matter if you're a Netflix type of company or a bakery, uh, if you adopt cloud native, uh, it will give you the ability to build highly scalable, flexible, and resilient applications that you can update quickly to meet customer demands. So as you can see here, the development and deployment of applications and its underlying infrastructure has evolved a lot over the time. From the sequential stages of the waterfall model to the iterative development of the agile methodology, today cloud natives are delivered through a DevOps pipeline with CI CD tool chains for continuous integration and delivery. Cloud native apps are divided into distinct services or units using microservices architecture. Each service operates independently with its own data and specific goal, and communicates with other services via APIs. These applications are usually deployed in a container. 
A single container might be used to run anything from a small microservice or software process to a larger application. And containers are a form of operating system virtualization. Unlike physical servers or VMs, they do not have operating system images, making them lighter and more portable with minimal overhead. Finally, on the last boss box there, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, cloud native apps are built and deployed in the cloud and are infrastructure agnostic, so offering consistent and experience across private, public, and hybrid cloud. This allows organizations to fully leverage cloud computing, resulting in responsible and responsive and dependable apps that can scale and minimize risk. So even though cloud native, cloud native offers many benefits, a lot of organizations are still struggling to adopt this new technology. So I want to hear from you. Uh, click on the, on, on yes, exactly. People already started answering. Uh, let us know uh, what are the biggest challenges your organization is facing when adopting cloud native infrastructure. Okay, security and compliance concerns are the biggest ones so far. I'm curious to know the other. I don't know if there is a chat uh, and people can yeah, write on the chat. Feel free. If somebody has an other comment that they want to make, feel free to write that into the, the uh, yes, question Yes, I would love sure to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, everyone. Well, I see a lot of people entering. Mostly security and compliance concerns. Okay, it's, it's very close. Cost as well, complexity, <laughs> everything. Lack of skills and personnel. A little bit of everything, right? <laughs> uh, so I'll get back to these challenges in a little bit. Now, uh, people working with, oh, let's go to the next one. Yes, no, here. People working with cloud technologies often assume that the cloud provider will take care of data security and protection. However, the ultimate responsibility for data protection lies with the company. So no matter where the data resides, you are responsible for the data on the cloud. Compared to conventional IT, cloud security and protection is governed by a shared responsibility model. As you can see on this slide, the cloud service provider assumes responsibility for underlying infrastructure such as cloud computing services, storage, networking, and database, but the organization retains responsibility for applications, data, and users. Like I, I would say the responsibility model is like renting a car. The rental agency provides the car and, and a tank of gas, but the driver still has to drive the car and avoid accidents. So it's still up to the organization to harden uh, access from the perspective of ports, credentials, and all the security details associated with using a public cloud environment. Now, let's delve deeper and discuss the most common security measures for protecting cloud-based data. You might know a few of them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a little deeper. Encryption first. This is a technique that involves converting data into a code to protect it from unauthorized access. In the cloud, encryption can be used to secure data in transit. So for example, data moving between the end user, end user and the cloud provider, and also data at rest. So for example, data stored in the cloud. Authentication and identity security. It evol involves verifying the identity of users before granting access to data. Some common ways of doing this in the cloud is by using multi-factor authentication like passwords and security tokens and keeping user identities and access rights separate. Safe deletion techniques. You have to securely erase data to prevent unauthorized access and recoverability. Some techniques can include overriding data multiple times 
shredding files, or using encryption tools, as we mentioned previously. And now, finally, and no, plus, managing access control. It defines and enforces rules for who can access what data and when. In the cloud, this can include using identity and access management, so IAM, role-based access control, known as RBAC, setting per permissions, and monitoring user activities. And finally, backing up data. This involves making copies of data to protect against data loss. In the cloud, this can include using data backup tools to store copies of data in a secure location, either within the cloud or on-premises. Now, this is where Veeam comes into play. Veeam offers a complete solution for contemporary data backup and recovery, offering a modern and fully integrated approach for protecting all virtual, physical, and cloud-based workloads. With various recovery options, it ensures that your data is always secure and accessible. And between a backup, replication, storage snapshots, and continued data protection, you have four different ways to best achieve your RPO and RTO requirements. Veeam delivers dependable ransomware protection and data security with its detect, protect, and recover features. With an immutable and air-gapped design, it has been rigorously tested for security. And additionally, Veeam offers granular perm permissions for added control. Now, you can confidently protect your cloud data with added benefits such as data mobility and portability and unified management. Modern applications can also be protected with native backup of Kubernetes and rapid deployment. As you can see in this slide, Veeam provides a unified platform for safeguarding and managing assets in a hybrid cloud environment, so such as AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, and it offers the ability to backup, recover, and transfer workloads across any environment, even uh, from on-premise to the cloud, from cloud to cloud, and all of these results in cost savings of up to 50 times when protecting cloud workload, workloads directly. So our main customers can be grouped into three categories. Firstly, those who want to store data in the cloud, but still have a large on-premises virtualization footprint and do not plan to move in EC2 anytime soon, I would say in 2023. They use the cloud for S3 backup and testing dev purposes. Secondly, uh, the second group of customers are those who have moved already to the cloud or have built their workloads in the cloud. So we, we call them cloud hosted. And lastly, the third group of customers are those who are cloud native and have adopted Kubernetes and uh, container-based workloads on the cloud or on-premises environment using Kubernetes managed services on vSphere or OpenShift. Now, I'm going to show you uh, customers, how a customer's architecture a diagram would look like. The common practice uh, we've observed in the field and among uh, customers that we support involves a data center on-premises with VMware components such as vSphere, vSAN, or shared storage and networking. And then there is also a small footprint of VMC on AWS connecting to the virtual center for workload protection, replication, and disaster recovery. Veeam also allows workloads to be moved from on-premise to Amazon EC2, EKS, and ECS. In addition, Veeam's products enable backing up and archiving workloads on Amazon S3 with the option to tier to lower cost storage like S3 Glacier and Deep Archive. So you can see all these uh, in the architecture diagram. And these are mostly the, the group, the first group, uh, the first category of customers that I mentioned previously. Now, the second group 
In this context, customers are fully hosted in the cloud. I'm using AWS as an example, but this applies to all other main cloud providers. Veeam protects workloads efficiently and consistently through snapshots and storage in S3 buckets. Again, with the option to tier to lower cost storage like S3 Glacier and Deep Archive. Veeam also allows workload replication between regions and availability zones for disaster recovery. So for instance, if the US East region goes down, customers have the ability to easily copy their workloads to a secondary location with the click of a button or via an API. And now the third group. Here, the main idea is that customers can easily move from virtual to cloud or from one cloud provider to another cloud provider and restore image-based backups on any platform. For an example, a virtual machine from VMware can be restored to EC2. Or another example, an EC2 instance can be restored to Azure. Or an Azure VM can be restored to DCP. Also, we've uh, Tasten that I'm going to uh, mention right after this, uh, right next. Um, a Kubernetes cluster can be restored to a EKS. And cloud-based VMs can also be instantly restored to VMware, Hyper-V, or VMC. So you have a lot of options, and you're not just uh, stuck with one cloud provider. We allow you, uh, we give you a lot of mobility and uh, allow uh, you to choose wherever you want to uh, send your data to. Now, here is an overview of how a customer uses our products for centralized multi-cloud backup management with multiple locations. Veeam Backup for AWS is installed in the AWS environment and utilizes AC2 or RDS snapshots for backup with the ability to store long-term backups in S3. And then Veeam Backup for Google Cloud operates in the same manner as you can see on the right-hand side uh, of the slide. Then, in the middle, the Veeam Backup and Replication Console acts as a control plane and a central management console, so integrating both Veeam Backup for AWS and Veeam Backup for Google Cloud into the Veeam Backup and Replication, which allows the customer to manage everything and see everything in one place. You know, I, I have to mention also that it provides extra protection by allowing backup copy jobs to be created for EC2 instances. So now let's talk about a little bit about Kasten. Kasten is a data management platform that was first purposely built for Kubernetes. Veeam is known for its virtualization focus using an agent-less approach to protect VMs when others are using agents. It leverages native vSphere APIs for consistent VM backups. And Kasten K10 operates similarly, residing in the same Kubernetes cluster and leveraging APIs, which enables the creation of data copies. Leveraging Kasten K10 by Veeam, it enables utilizing Kubernetes security fundamentals, such as RBAC, OICDC, and token authentication, and also taking advantage of public cloud IAM authentication models. The primary goal is to ensure ease of use for operators with a simple UI for setting and managing backup jobs and policies, while also being easily consumable through the native Kubernetes API. I'm not going into more details about it, but you can find a lot more information and demos on their website at kasten.io and even learn more about Kubernetes with their hands-on lab at kubecampus.io. And just uh, a caveat, Kasten is a product by Veeam. Uh, it was acquired in 2020 and uh, it has been growing a lot. It's our 
Kubernetes focused backup. So I advise you to go and, and check out these two websites. And uh, that's it for me. This was my, my, it was a short presentation, but I just wanted to give uh, 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 um, an over, overall view of data protection uh, in, in a cloud native world. Oh, that's awesome, Julia. Short but mighty. We covered a lot mm -hmm. of information in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I know that that's uh, uh, really hitting with the audience. I have to say, we got an absolute influx of, of fans and, and accolades from people out in the audience who uh, have, you know, uh, either are currently using, have used, or want to use Veeam. Uh, and I just want to make sure that we call that out. Also, some high fives to your marketing team. Uh, people always love the slides you guys put together. They're just oh, so nice. Fun. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> so absolutely. Uh, and I, I want to point out for everyone out there in the audience that we do have that poll up on the screen for you here. What we're looking for is what additional information you would like to get about the Veeam solution. So again, uh, make sure that you take a moment here and, and click on that poll. Let the Veeam crew know how they can follow up with you to make your next steps even easier. Uh, while you're doing that, Julia and I are going to dig into some questions. You, you ready, Julia? Yes, yes, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so this is a good question because I think there's a lot of people out there that in 2023 are re-evaluating, updating, or maybe creating for the first time their DR plans. So we have a question here. How can you implement a, a disaster recovery plan for cloud native applications specifically? Oh, this is a great question. So I actually didn't touch on that uh, during the presentation, but disaster recovery as a service works fundamentally in the same way no matter what your infrastructure looks like. So in the case of Kubernetes and microservices and containers, a uh, disaster recovery uh, solution would replicate and synchronize each component of your infrastructure to one or more additional public clouds, such as AWS, GCP, Azure, and others. Uh, so let's say you use AWS as your primary public cloud provider, and a massive outage, like the one that happened back in December 2021, uh, and, and it takes your application offline entirely. Instead of twiddling your thumbs and trying to manually launch your cluster elsewhere, you can fail over to your disaster recover as a service replicated cluster and get back to serving your users like in, in an instant. Um, and and we like to manage multiple virtual private clouds in one place. So you can back up, replicate, uh, or migrate whole clusters or just specific parts even the inter-resource relationships, such as the daemon sets, config maps, persistent volume, pods, secrets, those are more uh, Kubernetes related, but uh, Veeam allows all that. And uh, scheduled backup policies ensure that your whole disaster recovery plan isn't hinged on a single IT employee. And uh, we were talking about Kasten. Kasten also helps you proactively detect whether the integrity of your cluster has been violated, which means you can respond faster, isolate the affected infrastructure, switch over to the backup infrastructure, and restore from the latest unaffected backing, reducing uh, data loss. And for your end users, a disaster on your end might result in just a few seconds of lat latency, which is great. Hmm. That's, yeah, that's a great reminder. A few seconds mm -hmm. is a is a big difference from you know days, weeks, months, uh, which is exactly. what we're looking at here. Exactly. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the goal. Um, I'm gonna jump to another question here. I, Julia, can you talk a little bit more about how data encryption fits into a cloud native data protection strategy? Ooh, I love that question. Yes. So I mentioned a little bit uh, how uh, encryption is one of the data protection uh, tools that we can utilize, but and it, I would say it's an essential aspect of our cloud-native data protection strategy because it involves converting plain text data into an unreadable format that can only be accessed with the correct, correct decryption key. So this helps to secure sensitive data from unauthorized access, both while it's being transmitted or when it is at rest. And implementing encryption in a cloud-native environment
can be done in several ways, such as encrypting data in transit between microservices and clients using HTTPS or gRPC with uh, transfer layer security. Also, uh, data at rest trans encryption can also be done by encrypting data in databases, file systems, and other storage systems using the encryption, encryption tool provided by the cloud provider or by utilizing third-party encryption solutions. So encryption keys, they, uh, this is a, a, a good reminder that encryption keys must be securely stored and managed, ideally using a key management system that, that is integrated with the cloud environment. So clouds like Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud, they all provide uh, an inbuilt encryption for data in transit and at rest. So which all uh, can be easily enabled for the data stored in these services. Lovely. I hope I well, answered the question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and then some. Um, Julia, we're, mm -hmm. we're about to run out of time. I'm going to sneak in one last question uh, here, uh, because I think this is a great place to sort of leave our conversation. Um, wondering if you can shed some light. What are some best practices for protecting sensitive data in a cloud-native environment? Mm -hmm. So I think for sensitive data, a multi-layered approach should be used. So including like minimizing data exposure, encryption again, access controls, monitoring, using service mesh. There are a lot of things that can be done. And uh, uh, without uh, forgetting regular, regular security testing. So uh, these are, all these approaches, they ensure that the data is protected both in transit and at rest and the communication between microservices is secure. And also the, any suspicion activity can be detected. So all these best practices are very important, especially for sensitive data. Perfect, all right. Well, there you have it. That's some good things to be thinking about. Uh, and I, I hope that, uh, or I know that everyone in the audience got some great <laughs> answers out there. Uh, please do keep those questions coming in. And again, click on that poll. Uh, Julia, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, before you take off, any, um, for somebody out there that you know, is not already a, an avid fan of Veeam, as many people out there are, uh, what do they do to get started? What would be the first step to get rolling with, with Veeam? So I would say just contact one of us, go on our website or go on LinkedIn, contact one of us, because I feel like the best way is uh, talking to someone, like a real person, instead of talking you know, to a, a chatbot on the computer. <laughs> uh, reach out to us, and we would be glad to answer all your questions and show you demos of how the product work and uh, how the product works. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like that's the best way. I, I showed, I put my LinkedIn and my Twitter there. So feel free to reach out to me and I, I would answer all your questions. <laughs> and I'll stay, I I'll stay any longer here. If anyone has more, more questions, I'll answer them on the chat. Oh, that's great. Okay, perfect. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Julia, we'll get back to all the questions that are, that have come in and are coming in, and make sure you get some answers there if we if we didn't cover that in the in the live discussion. Um, and yeah, I agree. It's it's nice to be able to. The chatbots are helpful, but it's nice to have humans. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, we're a big fan of that here. I sometimes feel like I need to just type nonsense words into the chat so you all know that yeah. we're real people here <laughs> chatting with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, Julia, thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. All right, and I'm going to keep things moving along here, but uh, I do want to make sure that I thank all of you for filling out that poll and, again, for asking some great questions. Now, we're going to do a prize giveaway before we get into our next session. So if you've been waiting on the edge of your seat, it is finally time for that. Uh, real quick, now, now, see, now I'm bait and switching this on you. Very quickly <laughs> before I get into the prize and before we navigate away uh, from the poll here, I also need to remind you to head on over to that Veeam link in the handout tab. Uh, because there is a very, very, very cool uh, uh, report that I think you should all download. This is the Veeam Data Protection Trends Report for 2023. Um, so you're going to get to explore some macro trends, uh, cyber attacks, cloud-specific considerations, and a lot more. It is a really cool resource. I love these types of reports. It's well laid out, so please do go check that out, download that, and save that. 
for later. Okay, now I said prize, and then I moved away, and now I'm coming back to it. Sorry for the whiplash there. So let's let's give away a prize. So uh, we are going to do both a gift card and a phone. So I'm going to start with the gift card, and then we'll do the phone. I'm going to remind you again that you do need to be here present live at the Megacast with us in order to win. Our next winner of a $500 Amazon gift card is Martin's Canoe of California. Martin's Canoe of California. You have won a $500 Amazon gift card. And our next winner of an Apple iPhone 14 Pro is, wow, I love this name. This is Sherry Cherry of Mississippi. Sherry Cherry of Mississippi, you have won an Apple iPhone 14 Pro. Uh, you were not selected because of your name, but you should have been. That was amazing. Uh, congratulations to Sherry on your new phone. And as always, we will be in touch about claiming your prizes after we wrap. Don't forget, folks, there are still two more chances to win, plus that best question card coming in for each session. So keep those questions coming. All right, well, we are definitely continuing on with the fun here because up next, and I'm sure you can see on your screen, uh, this is a name that a lot of you will recognize and a speaker I always love chatting with. I am so happy to bring out our next expert, Andy Fernandez, Director of Product Marketing at Haiku. Andy, thank you so much for joining us again. As always, I know you have some great info to cover here today, so I'm going to hand the mic right on over to you. Take it away, Andy. Director of Product Marketing here at Haiku. I know we don't have a lot of time today, so I really appreciate your time and your attention. Today's focus and topic, as you know, is about understanding your cloud native workloads, especially in, in the context of data protection. So what I want to talk to you about today is kind of two things. One is really understanding the problem with protecting native workloads effectively. And then I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about how Haiku, how Haiku Protege can deliver data protection as a service for any workload, including your cloud native applications as well. But before we do that, I, I want to make sure that we address something important. And it's a very, very common myth uh, that surprisingly today still holds for a lot of people. And that is, well, my, applica my applications, my instances, my databases, anything that I'm running within AWS, GCP, or even Azure, it's automatically backed up. They are responsible for protecting that. But the reality is that if you go and you look at any of the fine print of a shared responsibility model, essentially what most SaaS companies and also hyperscalers and anybody who's providing infrastructures as a service tells you is that we are responsible for managing the infrastructure and the availability of those services to you. But you are responsible for your data if something happens to it, for managing it, for securing it, but most importantly, for protecting it. Now, why does that matter? Well, it's just, the cloud is still somebody else's data center, right? It's highly available. It's an incredible service, but humans still operate it. There are bad actors. There are accidents, nature, uh, things happen, right? Whether it's a deletion, whether it's a corruption, ransomware outages, something will happen to this data. It's the same principles that have always applied on-premise. We have to be ready to be able to protect them. The only difference is on-prem, people always assume that they were responsible for their applications and their data. Now we're starting to come to the reality of, okay, cloud services are incredible. This infrastructure is reliable, but I still need to be able to protect my data because something will happen, whether it's accidental or something a little bit more uh, malicious. Now, with that being said, though, even if you made the decision of, of protecting these workloads, it gets a little tricky, especially considering the fact that um, organizations are still running applications on-prem. You have some applications where you have your backup and your DR to the cloud, but they're still virtual applications. Maybe you also have some modernized applications and you're also running running cloud native services. Now, the challenge here is you already have existing on-prem backup and DR infrastructure. That's not going away. It is purpose built for that and it's needed, especially for those tier one, tier two applications. Now, this is already pretty significant time and resource requirement to keep these up. Um, but when you look at the options that you have from a cloud-based protection perspective, they're script dependent. Essentially, if you're using one public cloud and protecting a couple of instances, that's okay. But when you are running an enterprise or where you are running a high amount of applications, it is very difficult to leverage scripts to do so. And it does not scale well from a management perspective, especially as you add other public clouds and, and a multi-cloud strategy within the organization. And here's the other part as well, is a lot of organizations will lift and shift to the public cloud. Um, but when they make the decision to modernize and refactor these applications, they don't realize how many additional microservices are required to run that. 
and those services need to be protected as well. And ultimately, you could think, oh, well, I could potentially use my backup on-prem, but these require agents that are not built for cloud native. They're not built for cloud applications and are simply going to hold you back and they're going to require a lot of resources, a lot of time, and simply a pain to manage. And let me actually show you what this looks like. Well, any organization, right? Let's take the, the average organization within the Americas and Europe. For some still have a small footprint of physical applications, and you still need to be able to protect those um, with a traditional backup for those. Then most organizations we know are highly virtualized, and they have to make sure that they protect these virtual applications. That is additional backup infrastructure that is required. And of course, you have your disaster recovery. These backup company, these backup services on prem don't give you the orchestration, um, the DR capabilities needed. And so you're bringing in additional services and tools in order to do so. This was the traditional data protection stack seven years ago. This is already pretty high total cost of ownership. It was a, it was a lot of resources just to keep the lights on. But when you add a cloud, the complexity only grows. Think about what you need to do with AWS for any specific operation. Obviously, you need the AWS backup console. You need to be able to run and execute scripts on a per instance basis, on a per backup job basis. This is now a completely different technology, completely different protocols you need to follow from a backup perspective. And then once again, for all of the services that you have within an AWS and Azure or Google, those also need to be protected. That requires additional scripts and additional management overhead. And then, as many organizations do, they're leveraging multiple public clouds. So you also have to make sure that you use, for example, Google's backup capabilities as well. And ultimately, as well, you need to protect your containerized applications. Um, and this is even addressing what you have to do for SaaS, right, with Microsoft 365, with Google Workspace, and these SaaS applications that also need to be required. Now, what this really translates to is that if you were to effectively protect all of the applications in your organization from on-prem to cloud native to SaaS, it would be an absolute pain. It would be nearly impossible to do so in a way that is cost effective, in a way that is efficient for the organization. Think of how much time, resource and energy is spent just keeping the lights on with all of these additional tools that you've inherited plus all of the new responsibilities you have with the cloud model as well. Now, with that being said, if you had to think, well, you make some points here, Andy, but how, how do I go about choosing the right data protection service? How do I go about choosing something that doesn't sacrifice performance, but is also efficient and allows me to protect things as they are meant to be protected? Well, here's the, the following selection criteria that I have for this. The selection criteria is that one, when it comes to cloud native, when it comes to applications that are running in the public cloud, you need to utilize their native services. There's no reason for you to bring your own snapshots if they are already providing you an effective native way to do so. You need to make sure that you leverage everything that the public cloud provides you from identity access management to storage, to compute, to the snapshots themselves. You need to make sure that you leverage that. It needs to be storage and platform agnostic. Um, one, cloud mobility is a reality. Sometimes you may need to go to another cloud. Sometimes you simply need to make sure that you keep things offsite. Uh, and ultimately, it's very important that your backup doesn't impede you from choosing the right infrastructure. So this needs to be storage and platform agnostic. And once again, because this is an added responsibility, an added service, it needs to be simple. You need one-click backup and recovery operations. You should not be managing Excels and scripts to just understand where are my backups, what are my point in time recoveries. And then ultimately, it's not simply about just ensuring that you can back up, but that you can protect and recover effectively. And not just an entire instance, an entire workload, but being able to perform file level and folder recovery. These are the highest volume recoveries that you have to perform in an organization. There are way more deletions than there are outages and ransomware attacks. So you need to make sure that granular recovery is available to you quickly. And ultimately, whatever backup service you use needs to be 100% as a service. It needs to be something that is fully automated, fully managed, and that you don't have to manage upgrades, maintenance patches, or anything. That is technology of on-prem that does not belong in the public cloud or in cloud native applications. And ultimately, as we know, many organizations, you start seeing new folks who are responsible for protecting these workloads. Maybe folks within your DevOps organization are now suddenly the ones provisioning cloud workloads. 
they may have to protect it themselves. So whatever service to protect these that you choose, it needs to be self-service and there needs to be a zero learning curve. This is meant to automate and ensure that you can protect things quickly without spending several full-time jobs on this. Now, with that being said, now that we've understood what is the problem statement, what are the challenges that you have in being able to effectively protect your applications, let's take a look at how Haiku Protege, our data protection as a service, is able to help. First and foremost, just as a quick overview for you, Haiku Protege is a single platform that allows you to unify data protection for hybrid and multi-cloud. What I mean by this is anything from on-prem to hybrid cloud, meaning backup and DR to the cloud, to cloud native workloads themselves. It's backup, is that built-in disaster recovery, security, ransomware protection, and data migration and mobility. But the most important thing about this is that you're able to see, manage, and protect your applications regardless of where they are from one single place. Now, explicit, uh, explicit to public cloud, let's talk a little bit about the differentiations that Haiku Protege offers. First and foremost, it's an as-a-service model. Right? There is zero installation, zero upgrades here. One thing that I do want to clarify here is because when people hear, oh, it's a managed service, they're, we're leveraging their storage and they have control of my data. When it comes to Haiku, that is incorrect. Haiku does not store or touch your data. It is your storage that you're going to leverage. With that being said, it's a zero installation, no upgrades, it's fully automated. All you need to do is subscribe and you can subscribe via the marketplaces, whether it's AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. And ultimately, it delivers integrated billing to the public cloud of your choice. And here's the most important part though, it's, it's purpose-built. Uh, our engineering organization, we explicitly spent the time and resource to build things as they are. We did not cut corners. We did not leverage plugins and agents. We built them using the native APIs to make sure that you can leverage all of the native services from the snapshot level to the security and access control level, but also from a storage perspective as well to make sure that you are not sacrificing anything. And this is simply a layer of protection that works within your public cloud and their applications that are running there. And ultimately, we pride ourselves in our patented technology, our application awareness and our discovery that we can automatically discover any instance in your environment, that you're able to protect it as it is meant to be protected without the baggage of an agent. And ultimately that it's self-service with zero learning curve. And we always kind of talk through this and people don't believe it, but I can actually provide a demo anytime if you reach out. It's all operations should be one click away. That includes file level restore. Recovery should be instant. Your ability to subscribe to Haiku, you can do so in three minutes as long as you have billing rights, and you're able to automatically discover the instances and applications in your environment within four minutes. And ultimately, you have to spend zero time on architecting, deploying, or even on a learning curve. This is meant to be for any of us, from folks in marketing. Anybody can learn and use Haiku within minutes. With that being said, I want to talk through and hone in on a few things because this is incredibly important. When you're talking about your workloads within AWS, within Azure, within Google, you need to usually perform very manual activities around executing your own snapshots, running scripts to be able to protect them, or even leveraging agent-based technologies. But the reality is with Haiku Protege, across all three public clouds, you're able to assign policies instantly, meaning we'll automatically discover all of the instances that show up and assign a policy within a click. We have prepackaged policies that are automated for you, or you can customize themselves. But the reality is that within five minutes, you've seen all of your instances and you've assigned a backup policy within one click. But here's the most important part. It's being able to perform one click granular recovery, regardless of the applications that you are recovering, whether it's something like GKE, whether it's something like Microsoft 365, or for today's conversation, instances, files, folders within AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. It is one-click granular recovery that anybody within your organization, as long as you provide them access, can recover from. And ultimately, as we mentioned, the main value here, especially as we expand or zoom out beyond just one type of cloud-native workload, is that you are able to leverage this across all applications. It's purpose-built for VMware, for Nutanix, it's purpose-built for all three public clouds, and it allows you to protect your virtual applications, your cloud instances, your containerized applications, and even SaaS from one single pane of glass. 
And a lot of people always refer to, you know, painted glass as an overused term, but in this scenario, that's exactly what it is. One place to be able to see, manage, and protect all of these workloads with one click simplicity across the board. And it also includes built in disaster recovery. If you're looking for a cost effective way to make sure that you can fail over to the public cloud without buying an additional product or additional licenses, you can use Haiku to do so. And ultimately, that you have self service with access control as well across your organization. This is meant to, to make sure that you can offload all of the time, resources, and energy on multiple products, on multiple operations into one single service that does it for you. That is the value of what Haiku does. Now, with that being said, I kind of want to provide you with some uh, reassurances, right? Of There are more than 3,600 organizations around the world that actually rely on Haiku to protect their most sensitive data. Across the globe, regardless of its healthcare, financial technology, retail, they trust Haiku to be able to protect their workloads on-prem and in the public cloud as well. Now, I want to provide you guys a quick option here. We have released something called a free tier of backup and recovery service for AWS. And what I mean by this is when you think about what you have to do with AWS today, you have to make sure that you run CLI, that you individually protect these instances and have to perform scripts, very basic operations. And it's incredible service and it's free, but for organizations that are protecting more and more workloads, it becomes unscalable, especially as you add additional public clouds. So what we've delivered is we've delivered a free backup and recovery service that has zero capacity limits or time limits. It is a specific feature set where you're able to automate the snapshot management of your workloads within AWS. You can perform a file, folder, granular recovery. You can do all of this from a UI perspective with no scripts. Disaster recovery is built in. There are no additional operations required. And you have complete visibility, notifications, and reporting across all instances. This includes multiple account IDs. And ultimately, it's your storage, your data, your identity access management. This is not an additional data sovereignty or privacy concern. You actually don't even need billing rights to do so. There's no credit card required. If you scan here, you'll have the opportunity to simply scan, register, and within 15 minutes, you will have an AWS backup and recovery service that is provisioned for you that you can immediately start using. So I'm going to pause for a couple of seconds to make sure that anybody who's interested can take a look. We also offer free trial services for Google Cloud and Azure. You can go to the marketplace and immediately type Haiku and get started with the public cloud of your choice. But the last thing that I want to mention is something that's very important. And this is actually happening two days from now on February 1st. And we are announcing something that I firmly believe, all crap aside, I firmly believe that this will change um, how data protection is perceived, how data protection is conducted in the future. And the only hint I'll provide is if you think about what traditional backup is done and protecting you know, a couple of applications and SaaS to all of the SaaS applications that are within your organization, something needs to change. This is something that we're going to announce. I'm really excited about this and I cannot emphasize how much this is going to change the industry. So please go to our live keynote, register now. It'll be on February 1st at 11 a.m. Eastern, and I will hope to see you there. With that, I'm going to conclude today's presentation. I want to thank you so much for your time, and I will address anything within the Q&A chat as well. So thank you, and have a great day. All right. Well, thank you so much to you as well. Uh, what a great presentation. And, I, man, I also cannot believe that, I guess, two days from now, including today, we're <laughs> or into February. How did that happen? <laughs> Here we are in February already. Uh, well, Andy, thank you so much for that presentation as always. And uh, really, thank you for sticking around to answer some questions on live chat. I, I know that uh, always helps to get some answers going right away. Uh, for anyone that has asked a question that we do not get to on live chat today, uh, if the Haiku team is not able to respond to you, we will make sure that those questions get to the team so you will get some answers. So do keep those coming in. I'm also going to highly recommend 
recommend that you spend some time in the Handouts tab. So head on over to that Handouts tab now. Uh, if you click on the Haiku link, you can find the white paper, Simplifying Multi-Cloud Data Protection, Data Migration, and Disaster Recovery. So basically everything we are here to learn about today. Uh, you get to explore how Haiku Protege can allow you to achieve business continuity, data protection, resilience. You've got to love that. Uh, whatever your cloud environment looks like, there's something for you there. And then you know, they, they really do emphasize that all of this is done while keeping an eye on cost as well as unwieldy workloads. So uh, a lot of great information, definitely worth spending a little bit of time with that white paper. So please do check that out. Uh, while you are answering the poll, clicking on the handout, you know what that means. It is time for another prize giveaway. So we're going to do a uh, $500 Amazon gift card and an Apple iPhone 14 Pro. Uh, so let's pull that up here. Our, and I'll remind you again, I'm going to keep saying this. I feel like you can do this along with me at home now, but you do need to be here live present with us at the Megacast in order to win. And our next winner of a $500 Amazon gift card today is Vanessa Way of Washington. Vanessa Way of Washington. And our next winner of an Apple iPhone 14 Pro is going to Jeffrey Armstrong of Texas. Jeffrey Armstrong of Texas. Congratulations to Vanessa on your gift card and to Jeffrey on your cool new phone. Uh, as always, we will be in touch about claiming your prizes after we wrap up the Megacast today. And don't forget that there is still one more fancy chance to win. Plus, there's that best question card from each session. So if you're asking questions as we go, you are entered to win, and we'll be reviewing all of that after we wrap. But speaking of wrapping, no, I'm not going to wrap now, I promise you. But we are going to be wrapping up soon because here we are at our very last speaker of the day. But don't worry if you're feeling sad about that. We are definitely ending on a great note uh, because up next we will be chatting with Mohit Kishir Shagar. Oh boy, sorry Mohit. Mohit Kishir Shagar, <laughs> Senior Product Manager, and Michael Charette, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Metallic, a Commvault Venture. Mohit and Michael, thank you so much uh, to both of you for bring, being here to bring this mega cast on home for us today. Uh, Michael, I think you are going to kick us off, so the platform is is all yours. Take it away. Greetings from wherever you are logging in today. My name is Michael Charette, and I am a product marketing manager here at Metallic. Thank you everyone for joining today, where we'll cover protecting your Azure workloads with Metallic DMAS. Uh, please note that for today's purposes, we'll be covering hybrid cloud workloads across a few topics. First of all, we'll take a look at the current state of hybrid cloud and the challenges associated with its adoption. Next up is a discussion around why you should be protecting your Azure workloads. And we'll then pivot to Mohit's part of the presentation where he will provide a short overview of Metallic DMAS and look at some of the use cases associated with it. And we'll close out with a short summary of considerations for backing up your Azure workloads. So if that sounds good, let's go ahead and get started. Let's start by exploring what's going on in the hybrid cloud market. Hybrid cloud is very much top of mind for customers as they evolve their modern app and cloud strategies and also consider how to evolve their businesses. And while every company has a cloud initiative, the reality is that most companies are operating in a hybrid environment with data sources both in the cloud and on-prem. While adoption of cloud native technologies and containers in the enterprise is also growing quickly. So a few data points to consider, almost 90% of all enterprises are engaged in hybrid cloud activity. And more than half of IT pros have data both in the cloud as well as on premises. And nearly half of IT and DevOps professionals surveyed say that hybrid cloud management continues to be a challenge for container backup. So these are some pretty eye opening statistics, and they are expected to rise. And while companies navigate these disparate environments, they're also at increased risk from ransomware and cyber attacks. And data, excuse me, and data in silos from the proliferation of apps 
increasingly constrained IT resources and a growing use of cloud native apps and containers are just a few of the issues that are facing companies today. So what are some of the considerations that we need to keep in mind when addressing cloud integration as part of your environment? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. As we have said, while adopting hybrid cloud is definitely fueling transformation, it's not without its challenges. First, data is in more places than ever, places you may not have had to protect before, like SaaS applications. And more data, as we know, can also mean more complexity. Next, we've all seen how hybrid cloud adoption is accelerating, and unfortunately, it comes hand in hand with unprecedented risk. Ransomware and new cyber attacks are quickly trending in the wrong direction. We've not only seen a massive spike in successful breaches, but also a growing sophistication in the nature of these attacks. We've all heard the adage of, it's not if, but when, and this clearly creates new risk around data and system protection. Then we come to constrained resources. Successful digital transformation takes new and unique skills to drive change and to accelerate into the cloud. This complemented with the well-publicized IT skills gap in a post-COVID world leaves many IT organizations hamstrung in an already do more with less scenario. And across all of these challenges, we have data sprawl. As companies drive to digital transformation faster than ever, business data is increasingly spread across every application, device, on-prem and cloud environment. This multi-generational data sprawl is challenging to manage and safeguard even more so now as hybrid cloud strategies take hold. In today's era where change is happening rapidly and the stakes are higher than ever, we are seeing the meteoric rise in DPaaS or data protection as a service in our industry. But why is that? Well, for starters, companies simply need to do more with less as I previously mentioned. They also need very agile solutions with simple management, and they need flexibility for coverage at any phase of their journey, both now and in the future. And finally, they need to carefully consider how to safeguard their environments and their data against today's threats. It's important to remember that the job of protecting your data, regardless of where it's stored, is multifaceted. There are roles that you must play as well as cloud providers. It can be tough to know where those responsibilities, SLAs, and expectations fit. So let's unpack that a bit more. Most businesses who do not leverage dedicated third-party backup solutions are under the assumption that Microsoft and other native cloud controls are enough. Microsoft acknowledges businesses are always responsible for their data and recommends dedicated protection like Metallic, which is tightly integrated with Azure. And while Microsoft provides a robust, performant, and highly available application in Office 365 as an example, out-of-the-box tools are not purpose-built to meet the data protection needs of today's businesses. Dedicated solutions complement Microsoft's existing native capabilities, helping customers fulfill their role in the shared responsibility model. It's critical to educate customers on their data prote protection responsibilities with the growing risk of SaaS app and hybrid cloud data loss and where native tools may fall short. That's why it's important to understand this model. Let's look at the cloud service provider's role. Here, the cloud service provider is responsible for the infrastructure and underlying services of their SaaS apps, while the customer is always responsible for protecting their own data. This means CIOs, security officers, and IT professionals must recognize that the responsibility of protecting cloud data does not lie with their application providers. Then there's the customer's role. Data protection is the customer's responsibility. This includes data entering, living in, and leaving the system. 
And with that comes the responsibility of long-term extended protection of data residing in production and sandbox environments. And as you can see here, the shared responsibilities vary across service type. So if you'd like more information on this model, uh, it's available on Microsoft's website, or please feel free to contact us. So what does DMAS look like for the modern data estate? Well, at Metallic, from the start, we wanted to launch a solution with breadth of support for hybrid environments. And as we've shaped our hybrid and multi-cloud support, it's really been about giving customers the ease and agility they need from a cloud-delivered solution, which is why DMAS is the fastest growing section of our industry. And of course, SaaS app protection and hybrid cloud protection is core to what we provide. But some have seen DMAS solutions that stop there in terms of coverage. Well, Metallic is uniquely positioned to help protect on-premises as companies transition to cloud and multi-cloud with a control plane exclusively in Azure to protect a broad spectrum of workloads. Security is always top of mind. And as you know, a layered security approach is the best option. Let's go ahead and review five things that make Metallic security different. First, Metallic maintains this multi-layered approach to security starting with our Microsoft Azure partnership, which provides us with a hardened, highly secure and performant infrastructure. Secondly, virtual air gaps of backup data, AES 256-bit encryption, and zero trust access are built in to prevent unauthorized access to data. Next, Metallic also includes early threat detection capabilities and advanced insights into threats and abnormal behaviors. We also meet leading industry standards such as SOC Type 2, ISO.IEC 27001 2013, and GDPR. And then finally, Metallic is the only solution to currently achieve FedRAMP high status. It's capable of protecting GCC high and Azure government cloud environments. And all of this works seamlessly on Azure. Additionally, Metallic provides meaningful insights into backup data and threat levels to identify vulnerabilities and incidents in real time, seamlessly uncovering risks for early detection. And with Metallic ThreatWise, customers get fully integrated cyber deception capable of spotting ransomware and malicious insiders in production environments before data impact. And all of this is built on Azure, leveraging the hardened and durable infrastructure of the Microsoft Cloud. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Mohit. Mohit, take it away. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we sure can. Yep. Great. That's a great overview of Metallic. Thank you so much. Um, I'll now talk about the Metallic data protection capabilities um, in Metallic uh, and go into a little more depth. So Metallic hybrid cloud portfolio includes VM and Kubernetes, databases, file and object, and Active Directory. Those are the four offerings that you can uh, subscribe to from the Metallic.io website. Through these offerings, Metallic has full breadth and coverage to protect Microsoft workloads deployed either on-premises or natively in the Microsoft Azure Cloud. So with, my, the, so with the VM and Kubernetes offering, you can protect Microsoft Hyper-V running on-premises and Azure Virtual Machines using a single pin of glass. You can use Metallic to migrate your workloads from on-premises, let's say a Hyper-V environment, to Azure Virtual Machines seamlessly. You can then use the database offering to protect your on-premises databases like SQL Server or any other flavor of databases, as well as cloud native databases in Azure, uh, like Azure SQL, Azure Postgres, MariaDB, and Cosmos DB. You can use Metallic to migrate databases from on-premises to cloud native databases, or from cloud VMs to cloud native databases, or just take the databases to your cloud VM in Azure and vice versa, allowing you to do dev test kind of environments without impacting your production uh, systems out there. 
with the file and object offering, you can protect your Linux and Windows file systems in whether they're running in a Hyper-V VM or Azure Virtual Machine, or even a physical server in uh, which could be a Windows physical server in your on-premises uh, environment. You can protect large amounts of data stored in Azure Blob and Azure File Storage too. Lastly, in the Active Directory offering, you can protect on-premises Active Directory deployments as well as Azure Active Directory. You can perform granular backup and recovery of objects, attributes, users, and groups, as well as Azure AD applications. You can purchase a subscription for any one or all of these offerings. And when you do that, Active Directory will be included as a free solution as a part of uh, any one of the uh, subscription that you purchase. So with that, um, go to the next slide here and talk about uh, that. Yeah, it's great that we can protect all your Microsoft workloads, but what about the backup storage metallic provides uh, uh, the flexibility to use cloud storage or on-premise storage which means you can leverage your existing storage investments whether it is in cloud or on-premise optionally you can choose to uh, use commvault's hyperscale storage which is an on-premise scale out storage solution as well with the storage flexibility you can easily configure a primary and a secondary copy either using different storage targets say on-premises and a cloud copy or using different Azure regions. Let's say you want to have a copy in East US and West US. You can do that as well. You can leverage on-premise systems like HyperscaleX or your own storage uh, investments, like I mentioned. And in addition to all of this, uh, I know that we've talked about Microsoft workloads till now, but we also support uh, workloads like VMware, AWS, and OCI. And all of the storage options that I've mentioned above here are applicable to all of the workloads that I, you can protect to uh, metallic uh, uh, offerings here. All you need is a subscription for either VM and Kubernetes, databases, file and object, and you will get uh, the listed options on the screen as a part of that subscription. So why should you use metallic? I know Michael covered some aspects of it. I'm going to connect some of the technical aspects to the, the value proposition there. The number one reason you would want to do this is a single pane of glass to manage your workloads and back up your workloads, uh, regardless of which cloud they are in or whether they are in on-premises. Uh, as Michael mentioned that uh, Microsoft recommends a third party tool to protect your workloads. Metallic fits right in there. The, re the extended retention policies help reduce your storage footprint in the cloud, but still you can maintain your regulatory and compliance requirements. The granular backup capabilities simplify and speed up restoring your data from accidental changes or even due to bad actors. Flexible storage options in Metallic allow you to configure primary and secondary copy, like I mentioned in the previous slide, and you can use different storage targets uh, for your for each of your copy or, or different regions, and you can achieve the desired RPO or RTO as per your requirements. You can use Metallic's air gap backup store solutions, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides, for your ransomware protection strategy. And you can lower your risks by using the built-in anomaly detection and multi-layered security, as well as the security posture that will be available to you as a part of the Metallic offerings. With that, let's take a look at the first use case. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the first use case, uh, is focused on protecting your on-premises data and hybrid cloud environments. You may not know this, but Metallic uh, is uh, built on Commvault technology, like Michael mentioned previously. Hence, Metallic users can leverage Commvault's extensive coverage in protecting on-premises workloads. This is like all of the 25 years of experience that Commvault has so far. We are building it into the Metallic SaaS platform. Metallic SaaS solution is purposely built to simplify the backup process so anyone can back up and yet deliver enterprise grade performance lastly using metallic now you can easily migrate your on-premises workloads whether it is virtual machines databases or even just file systems to azure seamlessly the second use case that we, i want to cover here is about protecting your mission critical data workloads running in azure Metallic not only protects data sets like virtual machines, but also covers modern technologies like Azure AKS, uh, Azure Kubernetes, Azure databases, uh, like I mentioned uh, about Azure SQL, MySQL, and other database flavors. 
Azure files and blobs, and more will be introduced as time progresses. We provide, Metallic provides unique security benefits such as separation of security domains, helping identify unusual behavior insights, and has AI ML detection as a part of anomaly uh, activity detection, which is built into the platform. You can use Metallic to backup backup copies to more than one region, as I previously mentioned, and use the granular backup capabilities to recover uh, your uh, workloads quickly without impacting your uh, production demands greatly. The next thing I want to talk about is Metallic Recovery Reserve. I mentioned about storage options that you could we support cloud storage and on-premises storage, right? Now, Metallic Recovery Reserve is a managed storage solution that is offered by Metallic. And it's an easy button for customers who are looking for air gap ransomware protection. There is nothing to manage here. All you have to do is consume the storage and you can choose the storage tiers based on the type of retention that you're looking for. If you want long retention for compliance and regulatory purpose, you can choose a, a, a cool tier which is offered as a part of Metallic Recovery Reserve. For faster recovery and uh, improve your RPO and RTO, you can use the hot tier and you can combine these to come up with your desired RPO and retention requirements. The key to Metallic Recovery Reserve is, like I said, no management overhead. Simplify overall storage uh, requirements. You don't have to own any storage as such. And most important of all, it is air gapped and built with encryption. So your data is completely protected from the get go. Go to the last slide here, which is kind of summarizing what to look for in terms of Azure backup, right? The one thing that Metallic provides is air gap capability for your production systems. We can do anomaly detection uh, in the various offerings in Metallic. There is storage flexibility. You can bring your on-premises storage or cloud storage. You can cap, you can use only on-premises if you want to do a backup copy and have secondary copies to your cloud of choice. Um, you can do agent-based backups for the databases uh, to get granular backup capability. You can backup VMs entirely and uh, restore them uh, uh, as needed. Most important value prop is that the storage, um, when backups are stored in the storage, it is deduplicated and compressed uh, before uh, storing in the storage and over the network. So your cross-region copies are less expensive and your storage is also uh, less expensive because of this reason. The granular recovery allows you to recover specific objects. That means your recovery is fast. You don't have to wait for the entire VM to be recovered. You could do that as well, but when it comes to agent-based backups, that's where you have the benefit of recording specific files or folders. All of this is uh, encrypted in flight or at rest, and we support a wide variety of Azure native workloads through VM and Kubernetes backup, databases, and file system backup. Uh, you can also sign up for trial on metallic.io slash trial and uh, give it a uh, test run. Thank you, uh, Michael, back to you. All right, thank you, Mohit. Appreciate you sharing that with us and uh, appreciate the level of detail that uh, was on display there. Thanks everyone for joining us today. All right, well, thank you to both Mohit and Michael for that awesome presentation. Uh, lots of great info and, and as Michael said, a, a really great level of detail, which is, is awesome uh, as we're digging in. Um, we were kind of nearing the end of time, so I, I think what we're going to do is, is have uh, Mohit and Michael uh, stick around and answer a few questions on live chat. I, well, unfortunately, that will be short-lived uh, since we are going to wrap pretty quick here. But as I've said, we will make sure that all of the questions that you ask get over to the Metallic uh, and Commvault team. So you will hear back from them. You will get some answers back. So I know a little tight on time today, but you will get some answers if you uh, get those questions in. So still time if you have those burning questions in mind. And I know that you do. I can see them coming in. Uh, I also want to make sure that you see up on the screen here, we have that poll. What additional information would you like to get about the Metallic solution? Uh, so again, this is a fantastic way to just basically hit the easy button. I want to learn a little bit more. Not sure exactly where to get started. So uh, uh, let's let's just jump in uh, with this poll here and make sure that you have at least something that's coming your way as a follow-up and you can kind of start that conversation from there. 
Uh, so do take a second to do that. Also going to recommend that you head over to the Handouts tab uh, and grab the ebook, Why Wait for SaaS Delivered Data Management, Five Building Blocks to Hybrid Cloud Success. It's a great resource. Uh, it is laid out in a really fun and, and easy to sort of take in way. So uh, I would recommend that you kind of take a look. I like they're, they're sort of taking this angle of, of looking at the disruption of the last couple of years and changing that um, as an opportunity to evolve and potentially get out in front of of risks, um, so taking something that might have derailed you and instead making it a positive. And it, it's a really interesting read. So please do take a look at that. Make sure you save that for later. Uh, and I am going to give away another prize, and then I promised I would read the entire prize list to you all. So we have that coming here. So everyone get ready, get on the edge of your seats, get your drum rolls going. Uh, I will remind you one last time that you do need to be here live present with me at the Megacast, sitting next to me uh, today, again, on the edge of your seat in order to qualify to win. Uh, and our next winner of a $500 Amazon gift card today is Cindy Gipp of California. Cindy Gipp of California. And our very last winner of an Apple iPhone 14 Pro is Hank Rayner, also of California. Hank Rayner of California. And our entire winners list today, uh, winning a gift card, an Amazon gift card, Greg Middleton of Texas, an iPhone, Dick Cook of Indiana, a gift card, Maria Lopez of Texas, an iPhone, John Adeka of Washington, D.C., a gift card, Andrew Romanesco of Tennessee, a gift card, Martins Canoe of California, a iPhone, Sherry Cherry of Mississippi, a gift card, Vanessa Way of Washington, an iPhone, Jeffrey Armstrong of Texas, a gift card, Cindy Gipp of California, and an iPhone going to Hank Rain also of California. Congratulations to all our lucky winners, and we will follow up with all of you after we have Rats Day. Plus, stay tuned uh, because we will be following up with the folks who won that best question asked card. Now, if you are here on the Megacast today and you are thinking to yourself, man, this has been fun. What a great time. I agree, and I would also like to keep this conversation going. So if you would like to come and hang out with Scott, David, and I, maybe on a summit, an Ecocast, a Megacast, a webinar, you have something that you think your organization would like to present on, please do let us know. You can reach out via email at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to stop and thank all of our speakers. Uh, we had some, an incredible crew today from Spanning, Rubric, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Veeam, Haiku, and Metallica Cumbolt Venture. Uh, all of you really made this megacast not only possible, but a really engaging experience. And on that note, a very special thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, I saw some great questions coming in today. You all took some time to answer a lot of polls, uh, generally just participating and being a lot of fun. So uh, I had a great time. I really enjoyed talking a little bit more about cloud native applications, cloud infrastructure, data protection, recovery. I mean, we covered so much in just a few hours here. And I don't know about you folks, but my brain is all kind of lit up and firing in all cylinders right now. So I'm going to take advantage of that little rush and, uh, and try to mull over some of these things, let them sink in a little bit. Uh, before you all head out to go do that and get on about your days, I do want to make sure that you have marked your calendars and that you come back and join us on this Thursday, that's February 2nd, at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, so that's going to be 8 a.m. Pacific, nice and early. Grab that coffee and come join us if you are out on that West Coast. Uh, and we're going to be chatting defense in depth, exploring the elements of a layered security program. This is so important, and there's so many different things to think about. Even if you think you have the perfect security program, have you updated it? Have you checked in with it in 2023? Have you checked with every layer? Have you checked with every part of your team on every layer? These are complicated, complicated infrastructures and programs and plans. So come hang out with us, and it will give you a great little mental checklist as you're kind of listening. Oh, I haven't thought of that, or I have thought of that. And then you can feel smug and great because you knew you thought of that already. <laughs> so something for everyone. I hope you will come and join us. I hope that I get to see you all on Thursday. And until then, have an absolutely beautiful end to your day. 